Order in the name of Marie Todd on the age of criminal responsibility. I would invite all members who wish to participate in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. I would also advise all members that we have got plenty of time in hand today, so interventions uh, would be welcome. We won't be cutting you off shortly. And I invite Marie Todd to open for the government. Presiding officer, when I was elected as an MSP in 2016, the elation I felt was matched by my excitement for the opportunity that I had to take forward key causes close to my heart and dear to my own and my party's values. At that point, I didn't dare to dream that I might actually be in the position of being able to bring any of these to fruition as a minister. So I am absolutely delighted that the first ever stage one debate that I am leading as Minister for Children and Young People is for the bill which seeks to raise the age of criminal responsibility. I want to start by acknowledging that it's been a long journey to get here and to pay tribute to the cabinet secretaries and ministers who helped guide that journey. I think it's important to reflect on how far we've come, not least in understanding how best to prevent and address harm in children's lives. We should be very honest with ourselves as parliamentarians. Only a few years ago, we wouldn't be here with a consensus right across this chamber that the age of criminal responsibility should be raised. Now, our discussions are about what age to raise responsibility to and on what safeguards and other issues need to be addressed. Presiding officer, that is a significant and welcome shift. Collectively, we can agree that reforming the age of criminal responsibility will contribute to a youth justice system which recognises that heavy-handed criminal justice and early adversarial contact with enforcement agencies are counterproductive for children. We can reiterate our support for the integrated care and justice ethos that's been in place in Scotland for many years to respond to young children when things go wrong. That ethos resonates through the children's hearing system, through getting it right for every child and in the focus on early and effective intervention as part of the whole system's approach to youth justice. We can acknowledge that we and agencies, services, professionals, all now have a better recognition and understanding of the long-term effects of adverse childhood experiences and of the need for trauma-informed practice. When we consider all of this knowledge and understanding together, it becomes almost self-evident that how we address children's harmful behaviour also needs to change. This bill forms a key part of such a response. The bill not only reflects the aspirations of this government, but also the recommendations of the advisory group set up in 2015, comprising organisations working with and for children, victims, families and justice. And I want to thank everyone who contributed to the group's deliberations and recommendations. Their work is reflected in the principles underpinning this bill and its measures. I also want to thank the members of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for their considered approach to stage one. In particular, I welcome the committee support for the general principles of the bill in its report. I'll take the time needed to consider the report's conclusions and recommendations and to respond to the challenges in just as constructive a manner as they've been framed. I'll ensure that the committee has my response with sufficient time to consider it ahead of stage two commencing. However, I want to respond to some of the key findings today. I welcome the committee's support for raising the age of criminal responsibility to 12. There's a strong rationale for this position. Of the 700,000 children under 12 in Scotland, less than 300 are referred to the children's reporter to look at formal measures due to harmful behaviour. That number's declining, and most cases that involve harmful behaviour currently labelled as criminal are minor to moderate in nature. Our proposal to raise the age to 12 was also supported by the public consultation and by the majority of respondents 
to the committee's call for written evidence. I know that some... Certainly. Alice Crawl Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking an intervention on that point. Uh, whilst that's absolutely true that the majority of respondents did support the uplift to 12, does the Minister not also recognise that the majority of written respondents and overwhelming majority of oral evidence contributors wanted it raised still further beyond 12? Minister Marie Todd. I know that some want to see the age raised higher, but I also note that there isn't a clear consensus on what the age should be among those proponents. I want to reassure this chamber that I have listened very carefully to the arguments put by those proposing a higher age, including the position in other countries. I accept that the European average age for criminal responsibility is 14, but our comparative evidence clearly shows that the age of criminal responsibility doesn't mean the same in different jurisdictions. And making reference to ages higher in other jurisdictions without accounting for their own contexts, such as exceptions for serious harm or civil detention on mental health or care grounds, just is not nuanced enough. To arrive at useful comparisons, we need to capture the full complexity of how a system responds to children involved in harmful behaviour, their families and those affected. We should also recognise that the law has already been changed in Scotland so that no child under 12 can be prosecuted for a criminal offence in an adult court. That's different from many other countries, as is our approach to youth justice. I'm confident, therefore, that the position adopted in this bill to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12 is the right one. But we must all also provide for a proportionate and effective response by relevant agencies to the very small number of children aged 9 to 12 who may engage in seriously harmful behaviour. And that's what the measures set out in parts 2 to 4 are aimed to do. The bill seeks to provide legal certainty and clarity for the small number of the most troubling of cases to ensure that children are treated equally, fairly and consistently in such circumstances. It provides bespoke police powers to ensure appropriate investigation and proportionate involvement of the child in the most harmful cases. These powers are an additional tool to meet the specific needs of investigations into the most harmful acts and the needs and rights of children involved. They'll be engaged only when a sheriff is persuaded that they're necessary. And they'll only be necessary where agencies can't apply good practice via early and effective intervention or getting it right for every child conversations with children and their families and carers. This bill's reform to particular elements of disclosure is part of a wider effort through PVG review and the management of offenders bill. Taken together, They'll deliver a clearer, more responsive and more progressive system of disclosure. And I'm pleased that the committee took time to explore this in its evidence gathering and to recognise this wider work. We rightly need to ensure that those affected by harmful behaviour have confidence in the proven effectiveness of our interventions. I welcome the approach the committee took to this issue in its evidence gathering. We need to make sure that victims see, hear and are reassured that serious harm will be responded to effectively. Part three seeks to achieve this, but I note the committee's view that this bill represents an opportunity to consider the matter more carefully, and I undertake to do so. But I want to be absolutely clear that many children who engage in harmful behaviour at a young age are themselves victims. The data from the Scottish Children's Reporters Administration bears that out. Often children who are harmed against, harm, are harmed against and have experienced significant adversity in their childhoods. To insist that some children might be victims and others are perpetrators is too simplistic. All our work in prevention and early intervention bears that out and we need to take a whole child approach. Presiding officer. There are many organisations and agencies which have contributed to the development of this bill's measures and to stage one of the bill's parliamentary progress. Crucially, children and young people have contributed their views. And I want to thank the Scottish Youth Parliament, Who Cares, Scottish Children's Parliament, Action for Children, 
up to us and many others for discussing the bill with so many children and, and young people and for including me in the discussion with primary school children on the bill. I also welcome the committee's recognition of the particular needs of care experienced children and young people in its evidence gathering and that love and safety must be at the heart of our wider approach to supporting vulnerable children and young people. As James Doherty of Scotland's Violence Reduction Unit put it, you will never punish a young person into a better way of being. You can only love and nurture them into a better way of being. We need to look at what's missing in their life in the first place and replicate that missing element as responsible, connected adults because it's not good enough to say any more to young people, you're making bad choices. Raising the age of criminal responsibility forms part of work to address that broader fundamental question which the independent care review has been set up to consider and address of how to create a care system which truly cares. The most powerful testimony we heard at stage one came from a young woman, Lindsay Hambridge. I acknowledge that Lindsay's experience as a young person within the criminal justice system would not be helped by this bill. The bill's emergency power does not relate to the processes that she was subjected to. But it's clear from her evidence that she was not treated as a child in distress and difficulty. It's clear that the adult professionals around her did not respond to her distress in a trauma-informed way and that the situation escalated rather than de-escalated. What happened to Lindsay Hambridge was unacceptable then and it would be unacceptable now. I believe that the best way to respond is to have robust policy, procedures and training in place to prevent the entire unacceptable situation from arising. Focusing on the age of criminal responsibility as a response is frankly shutting the stable door after the horse has bolted. As her case and much more recent ones suggest, we are not getting it right for every young person who comes into contact with the criminal justice system. These are matters that have come into sharp and discomforting relief in recent days. And I'm working with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice to address them. We can be clearer about what we mean by a place of safety in this bill, which provides for a very specific emergency power to take a child under 12 to a place of safety where there's a risk of harm and the need arises to investigate an incident of serious harmful behaviour in which a child under 12 may be involved. I note the committee's concern on the provisions currently, and I confirm that I have asked for an amendment to be prepared which will include the full definition from the Children and Young People Scotland Act to make it clear that the same range of safe places can be used. I'll also undertake to reflect on and respond to their specific concern about whether police cells can ever be considered an appropriate place of safety for children under 12. Presiding officer, if there is one message that I would ask members to take into this afternoon's debate, it's that I am listening and I will consider carefully what more might need to be done to ensure that this bill gets it right. After all, our law benefits when it's the result of careful, considered and collaborative work. Our society benefits when we work together to consider how best to provide for our communities, our children, for victims and for our responsible professionals. And crucially, our children and young people will benefit. I am confident that the central approach in this bill to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12 is the right one. I am confident that at 12, we can build that shared understanding. And with this reform, we can build consensus and build for the future. 
I look forward to the debate this afternoon and hearing more of the views of members across the chamber. And I have great pleasure in moving that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, and I now call on Ruth McGuire to uh, speak on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Thank you. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to speak in this debate on behalf of the committee in my new capacity as the convener of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. I would like to begin by giving sincere thanks to our supportive, diligent and efficient clerking team for all their hard work. I also thank my fellow members for their care and compassion in exploring what were challenging issues and of course wish to thank those who gave evidence and shared their stories with us. At eight years old, Scotland currently has the youngest age of criminal responsibility in Europe. The minimum age of criminal prosecution in Scotland was raised to 12 in 2010, meaning that children under the age of 12 can no longer be prosecuted through the adult courts. However, children aged between eight and 11 years old could still obtain a conviction via children's hearing, either by admitting an offence or by having an offence ground established via a proof hearing at the Sheriff Court. The bill seeks to address this disparity by raising the age of criminal responsibility in line with the age of criminal prosecution to 12. The bill also includes provisions on police powers to investigate an incident of harmful behaviour by a child under 12. It ends the automatic disclosure of convictions of under 12s and makes changes to disclosure processes and the release of non-conviction information and information to victims of harmful behaviour. As a result, no behaviour by a child under the age of 12 can be regarded as criminal. According to the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration, around 200 children will be decriminalised a year as a result of the bill. That's 1,000 children over a five-year period. We heard about the harm caused by treating children as offenders from such a young age. Involvement in formal processes did not stop harmful behaviour. Once exposed to the criminal justice system, children continued in the system and moved on to become part of the adult offending system. Professor Susan McVie from the University of Edinburgh told us, those who end up in our criminal justice system disproportionately come from poorer backgrounds and a huge proportion of them come from either looked after backgrounds or youth justice backgrounds. The committee heard about what can only be described as harrowing encounters with the justice system. Lindsay Hambridge, a care experienced policy ambassador with Who Cares Scotland, told us her first experience of being treated as a criminal was the day she was taken into care at age 13. I'm sure other members will expand on her story and I'd like to thank her especially and all of those who shared their personal stories with us that will help us better understand the system and drive us to do better. Alice Cole Hamilton. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the intervention. Does the um, Convener of the Committee share my concern that at 13, nothing about this bill would have made Lindsay Hambridge's story any different? Ruth McGuire. I thank Alec Cole Hamilton for that intervention. I absolutely share that concern. I also hear what the Minister said, and I'm very conscious that I'm standing up on behalf of the Committee today and not giving a, a personal speech. Um, professionals also told us that the most traumatised were most likely to become involved in serious harmful behaviour. They were clear that having a trauma-informed approach resulted in better outcomes for children and young people, significantly reducing repeated harmful behaviour. And that is why we've recommended that any decisions made about very serious harmful behaviours by all children whether criminally responsible for their actions or not, must start from a trauma-informed perspective. I hope that the Minister will give a commitment today that all operational staff will have access to guidance and training materials to make this clear. We issued our call for evidence on the 27th of April and received 41 submissions from a wide range of organisations and individuals, including, amongst others, children's and social work services, looked after children and other children-centred groups, advocacy services and victims. To supplement our evidence, we visited three secure accommodation units, Edinburgh Secure Services Howden Hall, Kitball Group Secure Unit in Paisley, and St Mary's Kenmuir Secure Unit in Bishop Briggs. 
where we had an opportunity to speak directly with young people who had experience of the youth justice system. We would like to express our sincere thanks to the young people who shared their experiences and their thoughts on how the system could be improved. In addition, we observed children's hearings that support child protection and youth justice. We're grateful to the young people who consented to this. And I'd also like to thank everyone who facilitated our visit visits and gave evidence. It was important to us to involve children more broadly in the decision-making process of this bill. As such, we took an innovative step by developing a downloadable toolkit, which from June to October, schools and youth groups could use to discuss the principle of raising the age of criminal responsibility. Over 1,000 secondary students and over 200 primary age pupils engaged with the committee through these sessions. I'd like to acknowledge their efforts in joining the debate and hope that this will have sparked their interest in continuing to participate in matters which clearly affect their lives. Many issues raised by the bill were discussed in detail by the committee, for example, around police powers, the interviewing of children, and the use of a police station as a place of safety. With the rest of the time I have available, I'd like to focus on two key areas the age of criminal responsibility and the disclosure of conviction and non-conviction information. From the outset, we recognised the most difficult issue before us would be weighing up the various arguments to determine the most appropriate age of criminal responsibility. Many stakeholders queried whether a move to 12 was progressive or likely to meet Scotland's international human rights commitments. It was pointed out to us that increasing the age to 12 would only achieve the minimum internationally acceptable age as defined by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Such a move would also only just lift Scotland off the bottom of an EU league table and would not achieve the progressive increase envisaged by the UN Committee. Others considered an incremental approach would give time to measure and review the outcomes of the legislation before raising the age higher. We struggled to reach a shared view on whether 12 was a sufficiently high age to achieve the outcomes sought. There was, though, a recognition that the age of criminal responsibility in Scotland was last increased 86 years ago. The committee felt it did not want to jeopardise this long-awaited opportunity to address some of the most pressing issues around the criminalisation of children and young people. So we accepted that the approach taken by the Scottish Government in this bill was grounded in the desire to make improvements and to reach consensus in the interests of a shared commitment to improving outcomes for children and young people now to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12. Members of the Chamber will, I'm sure, have their own views on whether 12 is the right age, and this is a matter which will no doubt be further explored as we consider the Bill at Stage 2. Turning to the disclosure provisions. Under the current system, any convictions gained between 8 and 11 have the potential to affect a child later in life, as convictions would appear on a higher level disclosure check or protection of vulnerable groups scheme record. In adult life, this could restrict the choice of career or training, compounding the disadvantage already experienced. The bill would end automatic disclosure of information relating to behaviour under the age of 12. Also, Information about the behaviour of a child under 12 would only be disclosed as part of a disclosure application as other er relevant information following independent review of this decision. We worked with the Scottish Youth Parliament at their Kilmarnock sitting in October to co-produce a successful workshop on disclosure and non-conviction information. This helped explore the impact disclosure could have and underlined the need to involve young people in how the independent reviewer role is carried out. It would be helpful if the Minister could provide assurances today that, that the government will consult young with young people, with youth justice experience, looked after experience, those with speech, language and communication difficulties and children with disabilities and hidden disabilities in preparing the guidance. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Equalities and Human Rights Committee supports the general principles of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. Thank you very much. I now call Oliver Mundell to open for the Conservative Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open in today's debate for the Scottish Conservative Party, and I would like to begin 
uh, like other members, by putting on record my thanks to the committee clerks uh, and witnesses, and indeed my fellow members of the committee, who have put in a tremendous effort to ensure that the bill was well scrutinised at committee ahead of today's stage one debate. We on the, these benches are content to support the approach the Scottish Government have brought forward as part of the bill. And I'd like to uh, say thank you uh, to the Minister at this stage for her candour in her opening speech. I think it takes uh, real courage to come to this chamber uh, and to be as honest uh, with the chamber uh, in recognising some of the failings uh, that exist within our criminal justice system at the moment and the fact that not every child uh, who comes into contact with uh, our law enforcement and criminal justice agencies uh, gets the support that they deserve. And I think uh, that's not always uh, through want of trying on behalf of those agencies. And it's a very difficult balance always uh, to meet the needs of the child and uh, for those agencies uh, to do their job. So I, I thank her uh, genuinely and warmly uh, for that. Uh, we recognise uh, the fact that the criminal age of prosecution in Scotland uh, was raised uh, to 12 in uh, 2010. Uh, which already means that younger children are uh, sent to children's hearings instead of court and that children between 8 and 11 uh, therefore cannot be prosecuted in criminal courts. Uh, that in many senses means that this bill is simply an attempt to tidy up our legal system and reflects the fact that a significant change was made in policy some time ago. That has a benefit of simplifying Scots law as the Law Society point out and raising uh, the age of uh, criminal responsibility to 12 will bring it in line with the age of criminal prosecution, uh, providing clarity and will ensure that children are not treated and labelled as offenders uh, because of things they did before they were 12 years old. Obviously, uh, for the reasons already outlined, the bill goes slightly beyond that. But in general, uh, we think it strikes the right balance and that decisions such as this uh, are so central to the character of our legal system and the values of our society that they should be taken by consensus wherever possible. The age of 12 is not uh, random or arbitrary. It does have legal significance uh, in Scots law already, and it's emerged uh, through the government's consultation, wider discussions uh, and conversations, and from evidence uh, that uh, shows that there is significant uh, support and consensus uh, for raising the minimum age of responsibility to 12. Uh, that said, even at 12, there will still be uh, some degree of dis discretion for prosecutors uh, when they're thinking about uh, public interest. Uh, we do recognise that a number of witnesses before the committee, and indeed uh, some members of the committee, have questioned and queried whether 12 was a progressive uh, move or likely to meet Scotland's international human rights commitments. Uh, but we believe very strongly that the public must be on board and brought along with such changes. And for many, including myself, raising the age to 12 is a big and significant step. And I believe that the government is right to be cautious and see how the changes bed in and work in practice before considering further changes. This is a view that was echoed by Police Scotland, who suggested that 12 was the most appropriate starting age and that while they understood the debate regarding setting the age of criminal responsibility at a higher age, they were mindful that the nature of children's actions and the prevalence of behaviour changes as the age profile of offenders increases to 12 and above uh, it was, you know, was a significant factor. Uh, I think that we have to respect uh, the expert views of those working in the front line, and that is a balance between listening to the voices of children's organisations who do an excellent job, but also of listening to those of the law and justice agencies uh, such as the police. I think that the Minister was correct when she appeared before the committee and when she's spoken today uh, when she stressed that you cannot make a direct comparison in this area given differences in our legal system. Uh, I think a very clear example of that was the fact that the policy decision uh, here in Scotland has already been taken by the Crown Office not to proceed on a policy basis with the prosecution of those under the age of 12, something that isn't always reflected in the international uh, debate and, uh, and dialogue around this issue. And that somewhat changed the practical, if not the technical, uh, legal position. It is, of course, uh, tempting always to look at other European nations and to try and consider ourselves behind when it comes to this legislation. But I think that is a false conclusion to draw. It's about looking at children's rights and the way our legal system operates in the round. And that's how we best identify the positive steps uh, that can be taken. And I was very pleased uh, that the ministers paid such attention to the evidence from uh, Lindsay uh, Handvidge, uh, 
who was one of the young witnesses uh, to the committee, because myself, having reflected very carefully uh, on her views, it became clear to me that many of the issues she faced were not around the age of criminal responsibility, but whereas the Minister has already stated broader questions about how our criminal justice shows compassion and interacts with the most vulnerable individuals and understands the true nature and causes uh, of their seemingly offending behaviour. And I know that uh, the Minister uh, considers that issue uh, around uh, looked after young people very close to her heart and I would uh, urge her to use uh, this opportunity to look again at some of the wider issues that were raised in that particular session. I also think it's important to uh, consider the fact that the actual text of the UN Convention itself doesn't specify a minimum age of criminal responsibility and that uh, this is a suggestion that's come forward uh, from a committee based on broader uh, international interpretation. And as with many of the most difficult issues relating to human rights development, again, I would stress to some of my committee colleagues that we are on uh, a journey and part of that uh, journey is about making progress and moving at a pace that allows everyone to sign up and support initiatives. I always uh, myself go back to the example from uh, one of my law lectures of the sort of ship at sea uh, and sometimes there's a danger that in an attempt to modernise and rebuild that you can move uh, and remove uh, too many of the planks at once and end up without a ship. I think when it comes to our Scottish legal system, uh, which has and continues uh, to see significant change, again, it's important to move at a pace that allows for some continuity. And again, I would stress my view that this bill has got the balance right. Finally, and in many respects, most importantly, I would also want to highlight the importance of victims and to reflect on the fact that all crime has a serious impact on those directly affected, but also on the wider community, regardless of age. All such behaviour, uh, particularly when it's violent, must be treated seriously and acted upon. It's in everyone's interest to ensure that our young people grow up in the kind of society where they feel fully supported and feel that opportunities exist for them. Prevention is always better than trying to deal with the consequences, but we must be mindful too that when dealing with the consequences, it's possible to cause more harm than good. That's why we believe that the victim support elements of this bill are essential. A victim-centered justice system must at the very least be able to give victims and families information on how the wrongdoer has been dealt with, regardless of their age, and we believe that these proposals should not be watered down. That is why uh, we also believe that the police, uh, that police powers should not be unduly restricted. While it's right that the powers of the police are altered to reflect the fact that we will no longer treat under 12s as criminal, criminally responsible, we believe that the police should still have the powers they need to keep children in the public safe when wrongdoing does take place. And I would ask the government to provide reassurance that this bill will not make it harder for police officers to do their job. In conclusion, uh, I would simply uh, urge the Minister uh, not to allow this bill uh, to uh, become a, a vehicle for uh, that discussion around a higher age. I think uh, from the consultation that's taken place and the discussions at committee, we've reached a, a point of consensus. Uh, and I think it's now, uh, as many of my colleagues will do, about focusing on how to strengthen uh, other aspects of the bill. As I've already pointed out, Police Scotland have given evidence that significant behavioural changes take place at 12, and as the Minister has pointed out, the international comparisons uh, can be uh, misleading, and we need to recognise and thank our children's hearing system uh, for the incredible work uh, that they do uh, to ensure uh, that many children already uh, don't have to go to court. Uh, but we have to be able to justify this decision directly to victims and communities who are most affected by crime. As I close today, I offer uh, our general support uh, for the principles behind the bill, and we stand ready to work with the government and other parties to strengthen the bill where, commit, where consensus emerges. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much. I now call Daniel Johnson to open for the Labour Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me begin, especially as somebody who does not sit on the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, uh, by thanking the clerks and the members of that committee uh, for the excellent work they've done on their Stage 1 uh, report. I'd also like to acknowledge the 
work of the independent advisory group on the minimum age of criminal responsibility, the children's reporter and the many organisations and individuals who submitted their response and who frankly make this debate possible. Uh, but most importantly I would like to thank, as others have, the, the children, young people and people who have had experience of the criminal justice system itself as children because that experience is absolutely invaluable in terms of informing how we progress. At the outset, I'd like to state that Scottish Labour welcomes this bill and believes that it is an important step forward. We agree with its broad principles as outlined here in uh, the, 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 uh, stage one, and most particularly, we agree with the raising of the age of criminal responsibility to 12. But I think the Minister was absolutely right in her opening remarks, is that we have to engage in this debate in a reflective way, and in particular, the historical context. Uh, it was back in 2007 that the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child stated that 12 should be the minimum internationally acceptable age of criminal responsibility. And I think all of us should reflect on the time it has taken us to reach this point in actually making the change in our own law. But particularly, I think we need to reflect on this at a time when people elsewhere in this country and in other countries are seeking to undermine our international institutions. So I believe this is an important uh, debate, both in and of itself, but also as an affirmation of our commitment to the international rule of law and rules-based order, because now more than ever, we need to stand up for those international institutions because they are the beacons by which we guide progressive policy and we see a way forward, uh, both for our country and in others. But let me also be clear that this bill undoubtedly deals with tragic and exceptional circumstances. I think it's important to recognize that this bill deals with a very small number of cases and that there is a degree of responsibility in this debate to present a picture uh, uh, that, uh, that is accurate. Not all teenagers by any stretch will end up in the criminal justice system. Those that do, it is the most tragic of circumstances uh, which leads them there. According to research published by the Scottish Children's Reporter, which looked at a sample of 100 children aged between 8 and 11 years old, those uh, referred to the uh, Children's Reporter uh, were, were, were described as with 53% uh, as having uh, recorded concerns about educational achievement, 25% had been the victims of physical or sexual abuse, and 75% had had previous referrals to the reporter. So while it is absolutely right that when a, a child or young person has uh, responsibility to do some degree or other for uh, an act that we may regard as criminal or harmful behavior and that we respond appropriately we cannot do that at the expense of ignoring the wider context that they have found themselves children behaving in such a, 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 a way is surely a sign of wider social failure and that is the wider responsibility that I think we must all take before dealing with some of the specific points in in the bill I think there are some broader principles and context beyond the scope of this bill we must also be mindful of. The children's hearing system is something that I think we should be proud of in Scotland. It has not been the case for many years that simply once you tripped over the age of criminal responsibility, a child would automatically find themselves in a high court with horsehair wigs with the full force of the adversarial system. In 1971, the children's hearing system was set up to provide an integrated welfare-based approach to children who have committed offences. Um, and I think it is worth considering through the passage of this bill how we can strengthen uh, the, the, that system because as the Education Committee heard only last year, that is a system which is in becoming increasingly adversarial and what we cannot allow to happen is for the children's hearing system to simply become yet another court of law. In terms of the specifics of the bill, uh, this does make important changes to the disclosure process, which, as the Minister pointed out, is also something that has been looked at in the Management of Offenders Bill. And in terms of the, the broader criminal justice system, is an issue that has a, 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 a broad degree of concern. And indeed, I think other members in this chamber have put it uh, uh, very well when they have asked, what is the purpose of the disclosure system? And I think that is the challenge here. And certainly it is right, I think, to um, curtail the disclosures required for those who have committed crimes uh, under the age of 12. But I think we must also challenge our, ourselves here. And while the, the, the bill represents positive reforms, I think it's important while we look at, at this through stage two and three that we thoroughly investigate whether or not, uh, or how this bill will meaningfully affect change. Are we really protecting children from the harmful effects that early criminalization is making? 
or are we simply changing terminology? And I think we must seek to do the former rather than the latter. As the police um, uh, put it themselves, uh, that when, when uh, looking at places of safety, that a police station is not the best place for a child. And I put it simply like this. If you are a young person taken by the police when you do not want to go with them and put in a cold room within a police station, in what way does that feel different to being arrested and being put in prison? So I think it is vital that we look at the police uh, powers and the wider point for, for, for the reasons I think well set out in terms of the evidence that Lindsay Havinge gave and other members have, have provided about how uh, the reality of what is set out in this will be experienced by young people and whether or not it truly makes a difference to people, uh, young people coming into contact with the criminal justice system. In conclusion, presiding officer, um, uh, for, for, for the reasons I've set out, Labour supports the government in raising the age of criminal responsibility to 12. It is important that Scotland is compliant with the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child and we seek to prevent our most vulnerable children and, our most, and, and young people from being exposed to the harmful effects of the criminal justice system. And while this is the right thing to do, we recognise that we must seek broad support, that the consensus that the Minister outlined is not just important in terms of consensus in this place, but consensus out with this place as well. Finally, uh, this is an area of law that needs to remain under constant review to make sure that the children's justice system is doing what it's, it was set up to do. And I look forward to the progress of this bill as it proceeds through stages two and three. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I now call Alex Cole Hamilton to open for the Liberal Democrats. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'd like to remind the Chamber of my register of interest in that I was formerly the convener of TOGETHER, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Now, I will use my time this afternoon to offer the guarded support of my party to the general principles of this bill. I say guarded because rarely in the consideration of primary legislation does a bill attract such comprehensive pressure from stakeholders who want us to go further. There has been a lot of talk about pace in this debate. That is the rate at which we believe the public and the people of Scotland will accept further change in this area. Well, presiding officer, we have been moving at a snail's pace just to get to this point. It has been a long and frustrating road. Our commitment to raise the age of criminal responsibility was first laid out in a report to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in 2012. At that time, Aileen Campbell assured the UN that the UN that Scotland would bring the ACR to the age of 12 in the life of the last parliament. With legislative opportunities in that session running out, my friend and colleague Alison McInnes used a valiant stage three amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill of 2015 to deliver on that commitment to the UN, only to see it rejected by the Justice Secretary and voted down by the government benches. That vote ensured that Scotland retained one of the lowest ACRs in the world. I don't think it's unreasonable, presiding officer, to suggest that this government had arguably lied to the United Nations. Put simply, the UN set a floor of 12 as the minimum age of criminal responsibility to be adopted no later than 2007 and for countries to work upwards from that point. All told, three parliaments have sat and risen from this chamber since that international starting gun was fired. Only now has this government finally brought our country to the races. Now, the minister suggests that um, they have elected to stick at 12 because the majority of the respondents to their consultation agreed that that's where it should be set. But 12 is all they asked about. It is particularly striking, therefore, that a powerful majority of written respondents to the government consultation and our stage one call for evidence still volunteered that we should go further. The overwhelming majority of witnesses in our stage one consideration uh, in committee felt the same. And this was summed up, I think, most powerfully Powerfully, in the words of our Commissioner for Children and Young People, Bruce Adamson, when he said that we need to be looking at 14 or 16 as the norm internationally. If Scotland wants to be a human rights leader, I am very confused as to why we are talking about 12 rather than 16 or higher. Now, stage one was hugely important to our understanding of the issue, and I want to thank everyone who contributed to that, witnesses, respondents, and indeed our clerks. The experience of countries to go before us in that was vital. 
And we learned that Denmark, which had lowered their age of criminal responsibility from 15 to 14 on the election of a more right-wing government, had then reversed that decision shortly after due to an increase in offending behaviour and a decline in positive outcomes. But it is in the lived experience of young people which we found most compelling. Now, we've already heard of Lindsay Hammage's story in this debate. Um, it was possibly the most compelling witness statement that I have heard in my parliamentary career. A young girl arrested on the night she was to be taken into care. She was being removed from her mother and in her own words, she kicked off. This led to her being charged and spending a night in the cells. You could have heard a pin drop when she said, I spent my first night in care in a prison cell, locked up. I had done nothing wrong, but I felt like I had. She went on to describe the enduring harm that this has caused her. Presiding officer, Lindsay was just 13 years old, and yet nothing about this bill, not one clause or section, would have changed her story or outcomes and that she may well now face for the rest of her life. So I will work to amend this bill at subsequent stages to see us answer the challenge, not just of the United Nations, but of our sister nations across this continent who put our efforts in this area to shame. But Lindsay's story does not just shine a light on the lack of government ambition in the age they choose, but her testimony reminds us that we regularly lock our children up in police station cells in contravention of their Article 37 rights defined under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I was concerned from the outset that in the place of safety provisions of the bill, the, the only place so mentioned on the face of the bill, albeit in the context of last resort, was the police station. When only one place of safety is so defined, it runs the risk of becoming the default. And I don't think any of us would recognize a police station on a Friday night as a, as a place of safety for vulnerable young children. So I will seek amendments which promote the use of best practice alternatives. I will also seek amendments to expressly prohibit the use of cells for the containment of children. Presiding officer, I have fought for children's rights all of my adult life, and I do not intend to stop now. As such, we will support this bill tonight, but we do so with a sense of disappointment, shared by so many witnesses and stakeholders who want us to go further. This is not a radical bill. This is not even a progressive bill. Instead, it is a bill which finally achieves the de minimis standard of international expectation. On this issue, we will find ourselves on a par with the four most socially conservative countries in Europe. And as such, it leaves us wildly adrift of our shared ambition to make Scotland the best place in the world to grow up. Thank you. Thank you very much. We turn now to the open part of the debate, and I call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, President Officer. And as a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, I too want to associate myself with the convener's opening remarks and pay tribute to the clerks for all their work in pulling together the very comprehensive Stage 1 report. With the current age of criminal responsibility at just eight years, the lowest in Europe, this bill is absolutely necessary and the right thing to do. Almost all of the evidence we received, as you've heard, in committee agreed with this approach as an absolute minimum. And as others have already alluded to, the most contentious issue was not whether the age should be raised, but what age it should be raised to. Some witnesses, such as Police Scotland, as Oliver Mundell mentioned, seemed content with the proposal for 12, while others, such as the Children and Young People's Commissioner, Who Cares, and Juliet Harris from Together, amongst others, want to go much further, suggesting 14, 16, 18, and even higher. And there was good evidence used for these arguments, comparing youth justice stats from other countries, leading to a reduction in offending, and from neuroscience in terms of brain development. And I must admit, my own personal inclination is also it should be higher. However, I also note the strong evidence given by the Minister and some of the downfalls of direct comparisons and, dis and the discrepancies in some of these systems, such as in Luxembourg, where there is scope to keep a child in solitary for up to 10 days, despite having 18 years as the headline age. And I don't think any of us here would be advocating that. And it's also fair to say that we are a, uh, quite a difficult uh, country to draw comparisons with, as we have the unique children's hearing system, which places the, the needs and views of the young person right at the centre. And I do accept that there are issues with the system, as Daniel Johnson has mentioned, but, and some reform is required to make it work even better, but it's broadly a good system that allows us to treat our children who are displaying harmful behaviour in a mainly welfare-orientated and supportive way. 
And I think the Minister also demonstrated at committee that despite the name of the bill, the age in, in and of itself is not the only factor here. It's about taking further steps to make sure Scotland is the best place for our children to grow up and, crucially, reduce the negative effects of criminal convictions later on in adult life. And raising the age from 8 to 12 is absolutely the right thing to do. And in my experience working in, in social work and attending children's panels, I witnessed children accepting grounds to, to get it over with or because someone else, a parent, a caregiver or a professional, wanted them to accept it. We heard some evidence about this on the committee also. And although admittedly the numbers are very small, this bill does ensure that no child under 12 will be dealt with at a children's hearing on offence grounds. And perhaps just as importantly, although there are systems already in place to reduce the number of offence grounds for older children, the introduction of an independent reviewer for disclosures is ve was very welcomed by the committee and could be applied to under 18s. And I believe that this is the potential to move us to a situation where only in rare and exceptional circumstances as outlined by the Minister, would any child's involvement in offending be disclosed and potential impact on their lives as an adult? And that's uh, where we need to be, President Officer. Also, it's important that pub the public are fully behind us, as Oliver Mundell mentioned. The parties in here are all agreed that it should be at least 12, so that's something to work from. And the responses were generally the same, although I do take on Alex Cole Hamilton's point in his intervention earlier. Um, the Scottish Youth Parliament, when I visited there in Kilmarnock, were broadly the same. There was a broad agreement at the, at the end of the discussion that the people there felt that 12 was about right. <clears throat> Again, some people um, believing that 12 was just right and some people a bit more, but broadly very similar to uh, the committee's evidence. The UN suggests progressively increasing the age, and that's why I'm very open-minded to, to Mary Fee's suggestions at committee sessions regarding some sort of review. And I'll be interested to know if there is an amendment at stage two and what forum that might take. And that might serve as some sort of compromise on, on this, this issue. President officer, I also want to talk a wee bit about Section 4 of the Bill on Police Powers. There was a lot of discussion around a police cell being used as a place of safety, and this being on the face of the Bill. Alex Cole Hamilton has just mentioned it there and outlined his concerns, but I'd want to, to welcome the Minister's remarks in, the, in her earlier uh, statement, um, where she's, she's asked for an amendment to be uh, brought forward at Stage 2 to address some of those concerns. So I very much welcome that. And I, you know, I ask the Minister and Government um, generally to consider using the child protection guidelines that are in place for places of safety, which would be consistent with the overall approach of the bill. And we've got that down as a recommendation in the committee report. I think the bill also offers us an opportunity to consider how the police engage our young people involved in suspected harmful behaviours in a general sense. And heard evidence at both the Scottish Youth Parliament and a visit to Kibble about concerns uh, the young people have with these interactions. I know that the police in my area do a lot of community work with the youngsters and it's very successful, but for me, it's about changing cultures in our police and, and all services and sharing best practice and, and society starting to, to recognise that these behaviours we might think of as criminal are actually the result of traumatic experiences, in many cases, highly traumatic experiences. And perhaps bullying is, a, is an example of this. Uh, it's anti-bullying week, as you'll know, and I'll be asking a question at FMQs on Thursday on this matter, but how often as MSPs do we come across a, a bullying situation in, say, a, a school only to find out that when we engage with professionals that the alleged bullies themselves are also victims of often horrendous circumstances too. It becomes a very difficult circle to square in some respects, but how, how we deal with it and support both the victim and the perpetrators and our schools and others working with children is an indication of where we are as a country, what pro priorities are for individual local authorities and communities. The number one message we heard from victims is that they don't want what happened to them happening to someone else and we all have a duty to work together to make sure this happens through a therapeutic and joint-up approach. Presiding officer, it's been a great pleasure to scrutinise this bill at stage one. I believe it sends out a strong message of the caring and progressive country Scotland is, and I look forward to stage two in considering any amendments that come forward as appropriate. I commend the general principles of the bill to the chamber and hope it will be supported at decision time. Thank you. Um, can I say to members that we've got quite a lot of time in hand so uh, I can allow extra time for interventions and a bit of debate and uh, even a bit of droning on if anyone's so inclined. <laughs> and I now call Gordon Lindhurst to be... <laughs> oh, sorry, there was nothing personal, Ms Lindhurst. <laughs> to be followed by Gail Ross. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I, I feel that is a, a slightly unfair introduction to my speech. Uh, <laughs> An invitation to debate, perhaps, but an invitation to drone on, hopefully not. 
So I'll, I'll simply start by very briefly mentioning my uh, register of interests and my status as a now non-practicing advocate. The bill before us today will, as the Law Society of Scotland has pointed out, raise the age of criminal responsibility by bringing it into line with the existing age for prosecution. Uh, I note the Equalities and Human Rights Committee's Stage 1 report, which highlights Police Scotland's support for a raising of the age of criminal responsibility on the basis that the prevalence of behaviour tends to change beyond that point. Police Scotland is, of course, under a duty to remain neutral on political issues and will, I'm sure and trust, continue to focus on the detection and prevention of criminal activity by whomsoever it may be committed. The age of 12, after all, is already recognised in our law as a time of important change in a young person's life. Moving from primary to secondary school, being able to make a, a will, uh, being able to consent to or veto their own adoption. These are just a few examples. The report itself also, of course, provides others. A number of witnesses, including Orkney Islands Council and Police Scotland, recognize that a raising of the age also needs the buy-in of society. Because while a welfare basis behind doing so in terms of the offender is relied upon by the committee, we need also to recognize that there are victims of crimes for whom the age of the offender may be of little or no consequence. The age of the offender who stabs someone does not alter the trauma experienced by the victim. That is why it is disappointing to hear in this context that information for victims and how their experience was dealt with, for example, from the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration's Victim Information Service was limited or that it took time to get to the victim. The Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights summarized the point in explaining the important role that information can play in having experiences validated and knowing that harmful behavior has been taken seriously. We must be careful not to water down information provided to victims to the point that it can become meaningless. And this remains true even if, as Bruce Adamson, Children and Young People's Commissioner for Scotland, said, and I quote, for victims it was not necessarily about punishing the person, but about ensuring that what happened did not happen again. And I'm sure quite a number of us will view it in the same way as it's stated in that quote. Victims want to know that the wrong done to them is being righted as far as possible and the person who carried out the offending behavior um, dealt with and helped as appropriate. And likewise, and this, this point was touched on by Daniel Johnson, I agree with him on this, removing the name of criminality from the behavior must not be allowed to send a message to young people that they have no responsibilities for their actions towards others. In other words, we can't just look at this in terms of terminology and that would be uh, a wrong thing to do. And it is important when a wrongdoing has been committed that the facts can still be established by the police. Because as children first pointed to in evidence, and again I quote, these powers are crucial to establishing the truth of the matter, informing decisions about a child's welfare and the risk they pose to themselves and others, and to ensuring the rights of victims. So, while putting in place trauma-sensitive police procedures makes some sense within the wider objectives of the bill, we need reassurance from the government that the bill will not make it harder for the police to do their job. In evidence, the police raised these concerns. Well, I, I will, in fact. I think the member is on the committee. Thank you. Alex Cole-Hamilton. I'm very grateful to Gordon Lindhurst for taking my intervention. In regard to the uh, conduct of the police in their duties, does the member share my concern that the provisions in the bill for the right for children not to answer questions are not as strong as the right of adults to silence? And should the bill be amended to reflect that? Gordon Lindhurst. I, th I think the member raises something that is, is a, a uh, a very important point and I do share some concern about that because of course if one changes the behavior from being technically criminal that then has certain consequences as, as he points out in ECHR uh, and also in terms of law so that may be a, a matter that needs to be looked at I think I would agree that is something that needs to be looked at further in course of the consideration of the bill as it progresses um, 
I will. <laughs> so, Marie Todd. So I want to be very clear that the right not to answer questions in the bill is intended to make sure that um, children don't have to say anything. And any interview under the bill will be in the context where they are not a criminal suspect, as you say, um, and where their experience needs to be completely removed from criminalisation. So the bill deliberately doesn't echo the language of the police caution. If that's not clear, I'm more than happy to consider whether an amendment is needed going forward. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, I'm thankful to the Minister for that intervention and uh, I'll proceed with my speech unless anyone wishes to do another intervention and continue the debate. <laughs> um, that was not a general invitation to all members, if I might say so, Mr. Stevenson. <laughs> um, so, to continue on that point for a short, a short while, it is important that facts are established for the good of all parties to an incident. So um, one does have to consider the rights of a child who may be uh, thought to have committed offending behavior, um, whether that is technically considered crime in our law after this bill is passed or not. Uh, but it is important that the police should be in a position to establish the facts uh, and indeed, those who have to look to the welfare of the child, um, whether the victim or the offender, if uh, a child is involved as victim, that it is clear what has taken place to enable services to actually meaningfully um, engage with the situation that has arisen. Uh, and if I might move on to... Um, Another point that I think has been touched on by others already, uh, working with young people outside the criminal justice system to make sure wrongdoing is not repeated, repeated is also important. And that can, of course, be potentially undone later in life if a child is unnecessarily burdened with a criminal record. And indeed, there are provisions for certain crimes um, to come off adults' records. Indeed, this is a concept that is already well recognized in our law. Um, in closing, may I say, it needs to be emphasized that whatever procedures are set in place to deal with the matters we're looking at, the victims of what would be crime by any other name and the protection of the public must remain central to all considerations in this. We need as a parliament to understand that changing the headline age of criminality cannot allow us to lose sight of the need for addressing offending behavior and the needs of the victim as well as the adjustments that our law and procedures will need to accommodate it. And I welcome the Minister's comments that indeed these are issues the government will look at uh, going forward. And I think just finally, in terms of practicalities, uh, I myself um, have been locked in a cell with someone that I was uh, entrusted with defending who had been accused of um, an assault crime with an offensive weapon simply because there was nowhere else for me as that individual's counsel advising them, uh, and this was a person who was relatively young, uh, going into the actual um, courtroom situation. So we, we need to address these practicalities because if we simply make empty statements about ensuring that uh, matters are dealt with properly going forward, um, the, we will not be able to actually see that through and it can just become empty words and I'm sure none of us would want that. Gail Ross to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also begin by thanking the clerks of the Equality and Human Rights Committee, SPICE, the official report, my fellow committee members and everyone who took the time to respond with both written and oral evidence. And we covered so much and, and other colleagues have also covered other points that it would be impossible for me to fit it all in here today. So I'm just going to concentrate on the age itself and try and give some context as to why it needs to be raised. And I'm glad to say that so far it's something that we all seem to agree with. Um, as we know, today in Scotland, a child can get a criminal record from the age of eight years old. The age of criminal responsibility is the minimum age at which a child who commits an offence is considered to have the maturity to understand their actions and can be charged and held responsible in a criminal procedure. We know that children develop at different stages and that holding children criminally responsible for their actions can be extremely damaging. Presiding officer, it's becoming more and more accepted amongst people and organisations who work with children and young people 
that a person that commits an offence when they are very young needs help and support, not criminalisation. They need to understand what they did was wrong, yes, but as a society, we need to understand what drove the behaviour in the first place. The evidence is already there. Developmental psychology and neuroscience focuses on the developmental differences of children and adults, children's diminish diminished capacity and subsequent culpability. A low age of criminal responsibility means that we are responding to welfare issues with criminal justice responses and potentially damaging the prospects of these young people. Raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility would minimise social harm across society and not just for the young people involved. I was speaking to someone recently that was under the impression that we had already raised the age to 12. But just for clarification, in 2010, the Criminal Justice and Licence in Scotland Act raised the age of criminal prosecution to 12. This meant that children under the age of 12 could no longer be pursued through the adult courts. But now we find ourselves in the position where children aged 8 to 11 could still receive a conviction from the children's hearing system, either by admitting an offence or having an offence established via a proof hearing at the Sheriff Court. The bill we have in front of us now asks that we raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility to 12, in line with the minimum age that is internationally acceptable according to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. The Scottish Government's own advisory group, as the Minister has already outlined, recommended an increase to the minimum age of criminal responsibility. And 95% of the respondents to the Scottish Government's consultation agreed that it should be raised to 12 or older. Presiding officer, the oral evidence that we received in committee gave differing views as to what the age should be. The Children's Commissioner stated that, quote, 12 was never intended as a target, but as an ab absolute minimum. Professor Susan McVie questioned whether the age of 12 represented a progressive commitment to international human rights standards. Duncan Dunlop, Chief Executive of Who Cares Scotland, also suggested that a move to 12 wasn't enough. On the other hand, evidence from Police Scotland and Victim Support Scotland suggested that 12 is an appropriate age and that more emphasis should be on the victims of crime. Therefore, our committee has requested information on the current support for victims and how this is being applied in practice throughout the country we also ask that appropriate material, materials are developed to help victims, including child victims, understand how the harmful behaviours of children under 12 is dealt with. Presiding officer, from the evidence we received, it is obvious that we are all agreed that the minimum age of criminal responsibility should be raised. Raising it to 12 puts us above the rest of the UK at 10 years old, and in line with Belgium, Ireland and the Netherlands. Out of the other 24 EU countries, only France has an age of 13. All the rest have 14, 15 and 16. Although it has been said already in this debate, and the Minister said as well in her evidence to the committee, we need to take these ages in accordance with the policy that lies alongside them and understand that it's not as black and white as age only. One suggestion put forward was that 12 could be a starting point and that a review mechanism could be built into the bill and that the age would rise in increments once it has been proven that the outcomes for children and young people have improved. We noted that a review could take several forms, but we believe it's up to the government, not the committee, to put forward pr proposals of how that could work in practice. Maggie Mellon from Howard League Scotland stated in her evidence, quote, Scotland set the age of criminal responsibility at eight in 1937. Lord Kilbrandon said that there was no clinical evidence to suggest that that had made any sense at all. We were calling for the age to be higher in 1964. In considering review, the committee should bear in mind that it might take 100 years for evidence to come back, despite there being lots of international evidence showing different thinking about the age of childhood and youth. Presiding officer, we have waited a long time for this legislation to come before us and I thank the Scottish Government for now doing so. And I also thank the Minister for her clarifications she made in her opening speech. But let us not wait 100 years for further progress. 
I will end with paragraph 119 of our report. Whilst public opinion may be a factor in considering the age at which the age of criminal responsibility should be set, it should not, we believe, be the driver, the only driver for change. Welfare and the protection of the child should be paramount. Thank you. Rona Mackay, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm going to start my contribution to this important debate today the way I would normally end it, by saying that I support the general principles of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill at Stage 1. I support it because it's long overdue and it's a step in the right direction. However, I also have to say at the outset that I'm disappointed it doesn't set the limit higher. In my view, the age of 14 should be a minimum. We've heard already that Scotland presently lags behind the rest of Europe with eight being the age of criminal responsibility. In England, it's 10 and most countries are 14 and above. The UN believes the absolute minimum age is 12 and that's accepted internationally. But should we be moving to the absolute minimum? Although the 2010 Criminal Justice and Licensing Act did raise the minimum age of criminal responsibility to 12, children aged 8 to 11 can still be convicted through a children's hearing, either by admitting an offence or, an, or an established grounds via a sheriff court. And that conviction will blight those children for the rest of their lives. Presiding officer, when the children's hearing system was introduced in 1971, after the Kilbrandon Review, it put Scotland among the most progressive countries in the world when it comes to children in the justice system, and it's still held up as a model of good practice throughout the world. That's why the current age of criminalisation at eight is such an anomaly. It's simply out of sync with the way we treat children in Scotland. It makes no sense. So very few people could or are disputing that an increase is long overdue. I'm not a member of the lead committee of this bill, but I understand that they struggle to reach a view on what the age should be. I'd like to commend the committee and the clerks for the amount of work and detailed analysis contained in the bill, which encompasses a variety of complex areas, such as disclosure and place of safety and, and other vital aspects of, of child safety, but I don't have time to address those. So I'll, I'll stick my contribution to, which are related to the age of criminal responsibility. The advisory group uh, report published in 2016 recommended the age of 12 and 88% of those responding to the consultation favoured raising to the age of 12 or older. Presiding officer, thinking about this subject in preparation for the debate, I kept coming back to one question. What rationale is there to call children criminals at any age? The bill makes it clear that no child can be called a criminal under the age of 12. But does a child stop being a child when they reach their 13th or 14th birthday? The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child defines a child as anyone below the age of 18. I believe a child or young person who ends up in the criminal justice system is a child who's been failed by adults, failed by our system, we should have applied early intervention to stop the child getting into trouble in the first place. We know too that children are, are, we know that children are not born inherently bad. We know too of the empirical evidence of the damage adverse childhood experiences has on children and young people. And that has been mentioned, mentioned several times already in the debate and in this chamber throughout many debates. In my view, the importance of ACEs cannot be overstated. The children who appeared at hearings for whatever reason, reason during my time in the children's panel all had one thing in common. They were unhappy, insecure and confused. They had lost their way. They were there because they'd done something wrong, but instead of asking them what they'd done, we should maybe have been saying, what happened to you? Why are you lashing out, not attending school or being antisocial? Most were victims of a chaotic lifestyle. Some had no positive role models and far too many were children of addicted parents. Children who had experienced ACEs are 20, children who experienced ACEs are 20 times more likely to end up offending or incarcerated at some point during their lifetime. Presiding officer, of course children should, not be taught, should, not, should be taught wrong from right and they should not be allowed to run wild and cause hurt or injury to persons of property. We would be failing in our duty of care as adults if we allowed this to happen. Equally, victims have a right to know that they will be respected and that those who have offended against them will be dealt with. Some offences carried out by children can of course be extremely serious but the majority are not. But it's how we deal with children who are committing them that's the key. I believe providing positive guidance and intensive therapy is one way, 
but there are people, people far more qualified than me working tirelessly in the field of children's welfare who could advise the best way forward. As the Minister said, we need to take a whole child approach. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I reiterate that I support the general principles of this bill at stage one, and I look forward to the amendments at stage two. This is our chance to redress the balance for children in the justice system. Scotland has a reputation of being progressive and fair in all aspects of our society, and I believe we should not shy away from making a radical shift in the age of criminal responsibility. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Richard Lyle, and there's still some time in hand. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The minimum age of criminal responsibility is a substantial and complex issue. These were the words of the former Cabinet Secretary for Justice in 2015, when at stage two of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill, he responded to and rejected an amendment already referred to by Alex Cole Hamilton today, by, lodged by Alison McGuinness, McGuinness to increase the age of criminal responsibility. The committee then was evenly split, four for, four against, and on the casting vote of the then Justice Committee convener, the amendment failed. I abstained in the vote because the committee hadn't taken any evidence on the issue. Instead, I very much welcomed the Cabinet Secretary's announcement during that stage two debate that an independent advisory group was to be established to look at the implications of a potential increase in the age of criminal responsibility. Scotland has a, a distinct legal system which is recognised and admired across the world. It also has a strong record of protecting children's rights. In 2010, the law was changed, so no one under the age of 12 could be prosecuted in the criminal courts. And, ch and children aged between eight and 11 years facing allegations of having committed uh, an offence are dealt with through the children's hearing system. I think I may just be coming to, but absolutely. Alex Cole Hamilton. So does the member recognise that even though that's true and that children who exhibit offending behaviour are dealt with through the children's hearing system, they can through that process still obtain a criminal record that can follow them right through their life to their detriment and sometimes uh, the, the barrier to opportunities such as potential jobs in delicate positions. Margaret Mitchell. As I suspected, I'm coming to that very point now, Mr Cole Hamilton. Having said that, Scotland also has the youngest age of criminal responsibility in Europe and a lower age of criminal responsibility than nations such as China, Venezuela or Russia. Furthermore, as Mr Cole Hamilton says, no one wants to see ch young children potentially having a criminal record that can impact through the implications of disclosure on their chances of employment as a result of childhood behaviour. The bill before us today ensures this complex issue receives the necessary scrutiny it merits in an effort to give certainty around the disclosure of criminal records, the use of forensic samples, police investigatory powers and the rights of victims and to ensure the bill has the confidence of communities and the public. Its provisions having been influenced by both the 2015 advisory group finding published in 2016 and the Scottish Government's public consultation which followed. More specifically, the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill seeks to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12 and makes provisions regarding the release of non-conviction information for under 12s, information for victims of harmful behaviour, police powers to investigate an incident of harmful behaviour by a child under 12 and changes to disclosure processes. In the time remaining to me, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to concentrate on two areas. The first is the provision to set the age of criminal responsibility at 12, which in effect means a child under this age cannot commit an offence. This age, as the Law Society of Scotland states, is already significant in Scots law. Children of 12 are, as Gail Ross pointed out during her contribution, 
um, are already presumed at this age to have sufficient understanding and can make a will, consent to or veto their own adoption, express a view on arrangements for their future care in private law proceedings and at children's hearings, and are deemed to have sufficient understanding to instruct a solicitor. 12 also brings the age of criminal responsibility in line with the age of criminal prosecution and crucially removes the stigma associated with labeling, the, the labeling of bad adverse behavior of young people in the age to eight to 11 age group, which is in the minor to moderate, uh, moderate offense category. As a criminal with all these potential unintended consequences that that can have for these young people in later life. 12 gives legal clarity and I believe strikes the, the correct balance in establishing the age of criminal responsibility. The other area I want to look at is thankfully um, relatively, is the, the thankfully relatively few cases of serious incidents of harmful behavior by under 12 year olds. Scotland's youngest child killer was 11 years old when he was convicted of culpable homicide of a three-year-old toddler. Well, this is an extreme example. It does help concentrate minds on how absolutely critical it is that the measures in the bill are sufficiently robust to reassure victims' families and to protect the public. And here, the issue of the sufficiency of um, a place of safety, I believe, requires to be addressed. The policy memorandum states that the bill provides a number of measures referred to as safeguards by the advisory group to ensure action can still be taken by the police or other authorities where a child under 12 is involved in serious incidents of harmful behaviour. These include the specific police investigatory powers to establish the facts and whilst automatic disclosure is removed for a child under the age of criminal responsibility, putting in place independent consideration of information to be included in response to a disclosure check when the check may disclose non-conviction but potentially adverse information dating back to when the applicant was under the age of criminal responsibility. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I support the age of criminal responsibility now becoming 12, but consider it is essential that the above safeguards are monitored closely to ensure they are fit for purpose and to give victims and their families and the public confidence in this bill's provisions. I call Richard Lyle to be followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this important debate on the lowering of the age of criminal responsibility. And I want to begin my contribution this afternoon by stating clearly that I view this bill and this issue absolutely through the prism of international human rights and the progressive ideology that we here in Scotland wish to set as an example often to the world. Of course, this builds on the announcements made by our First Minister in so far as her programme for government is concerned around the embedding of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child into Scots law. It's abundantly clear that this action, alongside the action we are debating today, makes clear our fundamental rights-based approach to policy form formulation. Indeed, it is a fact that Scotland's current age of criminal responsibility at the age eight is the lowest in Europe. I believe that tarnished Scotland's international reputation as a leader on rights. And we can see that from the criticisms often levelled at Scotland from rights organisations such as the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and why? Because of our incredible low age of criminal responsibility. I'm proud, therefore, that the Scottish Government has taken these criticisms on board and is responding to them, de demonstrating, as I have said, our shared commitment to human rights. In 2010, the Criminal Justice and Licence in Scotland Act raised the minimum age of criminal prosecution in Scotland to 12, meaning children under the age of 12 could no longer be prosecuted through the adult courts. 
Creating this disparity between the age of criminal responsibility and the age of criminal prosecution, meaning children aged 8 to 11 years could still obtain a conviction via children's hearing, either by admitting or having an offence ground established via proof hearing at the Sheriff Court. Any convictions gained at that age have the potential, as already has been said, to appear on a higher level disclosure check or PVG scheme record later in the child's life, potentially preventing them from moving on from an incident in their childhood or restricting their ability to undertake a training course or a career of their choice. How bad is that? How bad is that? So that's part of what I call the why for the bill, but the what is obviously important too, presiding officer. What does this bill do and what does it, its core aims and values? Naturally, as well as increasing the age of criminal responsibility to 12, the bill also makes a number of provisions relating to police powers to investigate an incident of a harmful behaviour by a child under 12. Changes to disclosure processes and the release of non-conviction information known as other relevant information for under 12s and information for victims of harmful behaviour. I think for me, presiding officer, the ambition of this bill is well summarised by this quote from the policy memorandum for the bill. It shares perfectly the ambition of this government in a nutshell. The Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill was introduced in March 2018. It's focused on prote protecting children, reducing stigma and ensuring better life chances, rather than reflecting a particular understanding of when an individual child is in fact has the capacity to understand their actions or the consequences that could result from those actions, even for them or the people they may harm. As I've, as I've outlined already, presiding officer, the Scottish Government is committed, I'm sure is committed to bringing a rights-focused approach in all areas of government policy relating to children, especially when it comes to children who are most affected by early trauma and adversity. Therefore, it is clear that this reform will contribute to a youth justice system which recognises that heavy-handed criminal justice is counterproductive for children and young people. And it's an important statement for us all. Indeed, children under 12 are already protected from prosecution due to legislation again introduced by this government in 2011. And it is a fact that the vast majority of children aged 12 to 15 who offend are dealt, by, dealt with by their children's report, report, a reporter rather than prosecuted. At present, we have a robust framework in place to minimise early contact with the former formal justice systems through the principle of early and effective intervention, EEI, and diversion from prosecution. This requires appropriate support and monitoring to ensure effective delivery. Presiding officer, the final core element I wish to reflect on today is this. And that is to raise the ACR will benefit Scotland as a whole. I know that the evidence of harm caused by treating children as offenders from such a young age is clear with studies showing young people and children who have been involved with police and the justice system at a young age were more likely to offend as adults. I came across this when I was also a justice of peace many, many years ago. The quote earlier from the policy memorandum, however, a quote that I also wish to share, is from Duncan Dunlop, Chief Executive of Who Cares Scotland. And I wish to commend in passing the work of Who Cares. Scotland, who do such a incredible, uh, truly incredible work and offer fantastic support to care experienced people and in particular young people across Scotland. The quote from Duncan to the Qualities and Human Rights Committee was, the involvement of the police, and in fact, bizarrely, the justice system, means that people who are more likely to continue offend, are more likely to continue offending. We have to look at a different approach, and we should seize this opportunity. Well, I'm proud that this government is living up to those words and is seizing the opportunity to take action on this issue. This bill is focused on protecting children reducing stigma, 
ensuring better life chances. Uh, yes. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful uh, to the member for giving way. Um, I, is he aware that the words that he's just quoted from Duncan Dunlop in stage two evidence were part and parcel of a very impassioned soliloquy calling on the Scottish Government to go much further than it has done in this bill and increase the age of criminal responsibility beyond 12? I welcome, your, inter I, I welcome your intervention and, and I know how passionate Alec Cole Hamilton, there I got your name right for a change, uh, the wee joke that Alec Cole Hamilton and I have. I know how much you are pushing on this, but, you know, let's be realistic. You know, I live in the real world, and the real world is, we're raising it from 8 to 12. Okay, 14 in other countries and, and, and other ages in other countries, but it's a step in the right direction. And with the greatest respect to you, Mr. Alec Cole Hamilton, it's a step that we have to take. And you may want to grandstand and say, I'm going to... Uh, put it up to this, I'm going to put it up to that. Well, that's your prerogative. But as far, far as I'm concerned, I intend to support my government, who I believe is taking the right step. So, in consensus of togetherness, as I consider myself a friend of yours, as we've, we've been together for a, a, f a few times on different committees, as far as I'm concerned, I would want you to listen, to learn, and to follow. Better future chances, a noble ambition, and one that I'm sure across this chamber would wish to deliver. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm terribly glad you two are still pals. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Fee, to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, presiding officer. In Welcoming the principles of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill, can I say at the outset of my contribution that I believe it is frankly ludicrous that children as young as eight in Scotland have been criminalised for over 80 years. No other country in Europe has such a low age of criminal responsibility. And it is long overdue that we rectify what I consider to be wrong and make this change. Can I, at this opportunity, thank my fellow committee members for all of their um, hard work during this um, inquiry and in the preparation of, of this report? And can I also thank the clerks of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for their diligent work in supporting every single one of us, reaching out to all stakeholders and gathering the compelling evidence which is in our Stage 1 report. Equally, my thanks go to every individual and organisation who provided evidence, and most importantly, to the young people we met in committee and on visits for being open and honest about the impact the criminal justice system has had on their lives. And the vast majority of respondents to the call for evidence backed raising the minimum age of criminal responsibility, with some advocating a higher age than is proposed in the bill. And it is our duty now as politicians to listen to those with greater experience and greater understanding of this issue and to right the wrong that has criminalised children in Scotland. The United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child suggests that 12 should be the minimum across the world. And it is, I am sad to say, a reflection of our society that Scotland is at the bottom of the table of EU member states. The majority of EU states have 14, and even with this bill, we remain behind the rest of Europe. Even by raising the age to 12, the inconsistencies around children and Scots law, as pointed out by many stakeholders, remains a problem, and is a problem that must be addressed. And, presiding officer, the lifelong damage that can be done to a child becoming involved in the criminal justice system is evident. It can influence education, health, well-being, and could lead to children becoming normalised to the system and becoming an offender at a later age. A range of professionals told the committee 
that children's brains often did not fully mature until much later in life, with full emotional maturity not being achieved until the late teens or even up to the age of 25. Children first said that not all children mature at the same rate and some understand and interpret consequences and process differently to others. The Centre for Youth and Criminal Justice told the committee, for children growing up in families and communities where others around them are engaged in criminal and harmful behaviours, it can be extremely difficult, if not impossible, for them to understand what criminal behaviour is and also to be able to exercise choice over what they do. And this leads me to the impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences. The committee heard that children and young people involved in the criminal justice system had experienced trauma in their life, some more severe than others. And research published in 2016 by the Scottish Children's Reporter found that of 100 children aged 8 to 11 who were referred to the reporter, many had a range of pre-existing problems, which included 39% of children with disabilities and physical or mental health problems, and some had both. 25% of children had been victims of sexual and or other physical abuse. And the researchers also showed serious concerns around the education of children, with attendance and behaviour affecting over half of them. And that is why it's crucially important that the approach to dealing with harmful behaviour is focused on trauma-informed perspective. And I do back the government's recommendation that the government and other public authorities amend supporting guidance and training materials to be framed around trauma. We must recognise the serious consequences that austerity can have on the lives of young children, as many suffer the brunt of cuts to welfare and public services, particularly in education. And, presiding officer, when removed from a, harm, a harmful situation, a child must be taken to an appropriate place of safety, and a police station must always be the last resort. And I am grateful the Minister has taken cognizance of the request from the committee to take into account the full definition of place of safety as set out in section 2021 of the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011. And reinforcing this position is the testimony of Lindsay Hanbridge, a care experienced policy ambassador for Who Cares. Ms Hanbridge's courage to talk about her experiences are greatly appreciated by everyone on the committee. And when you hear phrases such as, they tried to force me, they put me in handcuffs in my mum's house in front of her and my brother and sister. And most chillingly of all, I spent my first night in care in a prison cell. From a young woman retelling trauma she experienced at only 13, it shows that change is required to keep children and young people away from such stressful and frightening situations, regardless of the reasons that led to that situation. And James Doherty from the Violence Reduction Unit related to his own experiences as a young child spending time in a police station. He told the committee, I spent time in prison cells as a wee boy and I was terrified. That is the overarching feeling that I can remember of being in a police station as a wee boy. It was too clinical and too full of noise. What was never taken into account was the psychological and emotional impact that that had on me. And finally, presiding officer, in closing, can I welcome the principles of the bill to rage the age of criminal responsibility and better protect children from harmful effects of early criminalisation. Thank you. Call Sandra White to be followed by Alison Harris. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And can I just say we've had some excellent speeches. Uh, I think everyone uh, together wants to see this to be a success. I believe probably the only thing, the sticking point is the differences in age. 
and I'm sure that will come through as we go to stage two and stage three. I'm not a member of the Justice Committee or the Equal, as I called it then, the Equal Opportunities Committee, uh, but I'm thankful to be able to speak in this debate. And like others, I want to thank the many groups and individuals who did take part in the consultation and evidence sessions in regards to this bill. And as a previous member of the Justice Committee, uh, others who were previous members also, will recollect the amount of times the age of criminal responsibility uh, basically came up uh, in, in various guises in the Justice Committee when we were looking at various bills as well. It was certainly raised many, many times. And I'm pleased that we're discussing stage one of this bill just now, which, if passed, would ensure no child under 12 being treated as a criminal or accruing a criminal record. And I think that's an important point. Others have raised it, but for me, it's a very, very important point. It's welcome, in particular, uh, because of you know the convictions and having that conviction. And it's not just at the age of 12 or even under 12. Members speaking to people in remand centres and Berlini as well, particularly young men, unfortunately, um, who had done something. Yeah, it was criminal, but sometimes it was something stupid. And they had that on their, their record for, forever. And at that age, didn't really realise that was going to be there. And basically, it's a barrier for them as they get older, as others have said, you know, to even get into training or to branch out in a career. And I think that's one of the most important things to get this off of there uh, altogether, uh, off of the, the high-level disclosure checks or PVG records, uh, because obviously, as I said, it can really have an impact later on in a child's life. Now, Oliver Mandel, I think, raised, and others had raised the, uh, the issue of parity with the justice system. And I think when you look through both uh, reports, you'll see that there is this um, parity, or at the moment not parity, but if this goes through at the age of 12, there will be parity with the, the justice system with this bill. And he is correct in saying that the age of, raising the age of criminal responsibility from 8 to 12 will align it with the current minimum age of prosecution. Now, I think it's important to look at that, uh, but it does so throw up, for me anyway, maybe the minister can enlighten me, or perhaps as it goes on the stages can enlighten me, I'm not a lawyer, but having read through it, to me, it throws up some serious questions in relation to what age even. Now, if it's raised to, say, 14 years of age, or it could even be older, uh, then the age of prosecution would have to be looked at as well. Uh, I also look at the children's hearing system, which is excellent and has been raised with people too. Would this need to be changed if the age of criminal responsibility is raised above 12? I'd just like to get a bit of clarification from lawyers on that, and I'm sure I will. Uh, as Margaret Mitchell has already said, at the age of 12, you can make a will, you can consent to a veto, uh, your own adoption, express views in private law proceedings. However, as Gail Ross said, and I thought it was pretty poignant, it's not all about black and white on age. And I think that's a, that's a point we, we need to remember also. And I want to turn to the Equal, well, Equality and Human Rights Committee report. Uh, I want to once again thank everyone who took part in that, as Mary Fee said, the excellent evidence that was, it was given there and also contributed to it. And I think it is an excellent report. Now, Mary Fee mentioned one of, I think, the most poignant parts of the report, and that was page 28, and that was on the children's hearing. Because when you read that, it's just unbelievable. And as you know, elected members, you know, we come across constituents and others nearly every day. If it's not in a constituency, it's you know, visiting a police station or even going out with the street passers at night or visiting schools as well. It's not just about the age. You know, I don't know if it should be 12, 14, 16, or even 18. I'll leave my mind open to that. But when you look at what came from the children's hearings, 75% had previous referrals to the reporter, 70 children had been referred on non-offence grounds, and five on offence grounds. 26 children were on compulsory supervision orders at the time of the offence referral incidents. And the report, this, the conclusion of the report, established, and that's what we've got to remember, it established a clear link between children's welfare needs and harmful behaviour. Now, I know this is, you know, a, a bill about criminal responsibility in the age, but you cannot get away just by putting an age up or whatever without looking at the background of these children. 
And when you go, you know, you go out with the street pastors or you go visiting, you know, children's homes, whatever it may be. I hate the word homes, actually. Residential units, whatever it may be. And you see and hear of the traumatic experience a number of these kids, or most of them, have had throughout their life. It's care that they need, care and love that they need. Because basically, lots of these children haven't had a start in life. They don't know anything else. So whilst, yeah, we do, through law, want to increase the age of responsibility, we really need to look at what's happened in their lives in the past. Let's perhaps intervene a wee bit sooner when these kids, as the Children's Hearing has said, five times have been reported. We talk about revolving doors for criminals. Sometimes a revolving door for these kids. They go to foster care, they go back to perhaps the parents who have got chaotic lifestyle, then they're back in again. How do you think that must affect their minds? It certainly would affect my mind. I'm sure it would affect everybody's mind as well. So whilst, yes, it's, it's, this is the bill and we're looking at the age, but let's concentrate on in between as well. Let's get it right for every child, obviously, perfect, whatever you want to call it. But let's get it right for these kids, because these kids are the future. And as Mary Fee had said, and I know Mary there's a lot of work in the prisons and, the, and the, the children as well, we're not just looking at some kids, we're looking at three and fourth generations. And if we want to stop that, we have to do something about that. Thank you very much, President Officer. Call Alison Harris to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to be speaking in this stage one debate on the age of criminal responsibility. As members have already said, this proposed legislation aims to raise the minimum age at which a criminal offence can be made from 8 to 12. Whilst it seems we're all agreed that this should happen, there are perhaps some differing reasons across the chamber as to why this should happen. I believe I'm a practical person, and so to me it seems logical that we should raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12, because that's already the minimum age at which you can be prosecuted. Members have mentioned that raising the age to 12 would bring Scotland in line with the United Nations minimum level. However, I don't want to spend too much time comparing minimum ages within different countries' legal systems because I'm not entirely convinced it's a wholly useful comparison, given the variation in cultures internationally. Some members have said that the age being 12 would still be on the low end in comparison with other countries. But I feel this doesn't take into account what other rules apply in these countries, such as exemptions based on the severity of the crime. Here in Scotland, we have a strong support first approach for children and have had this since the 1960s. I think that it's more important than continually focusing on age alone. However, this bill has been brought forward because there are some problems which have been identified due to the age of responsibility currently being eight. An advisory group was set up in 2015 to have a closer look at the proposal and they came back with some key recommendations. These have formed the basic structure of the bill. Of these recommendations, the topic of disclosure appears to be an important and troublesome one. Whilst children under 12 cannot be convicted of a crime, they can be summoned to hearings or have their involvement in harmful behaviour disclosed by the police, resulting in knock-on effects that can run deep into their lives. Having a black mark against their name can have the effect of limiting choice for children further on in life at school, further and on higher education and even further into employment. As well as this, there can be a stigma attached to the term offender, which can lead to isolation and the potential of further offences. And this is an outcome we all want to avoid. That's why disclosure and its consequences is such a high priority in the bill with the policy memorandum stating that the bill was designed to reduce stigma, protect children and ensure better life chances for them. Upping the age to 12 would aid in correcting this problem, at least for those children between 8 and 11 at the time of their actions. Beyond the age of 12, I think children should be treated with more responsibility. From my own experience, I have to say that for the most part, by the time someone reaches the age of 12, they are perfectly well aware of knowing what they are doing. And they should realise that there are consequences to their actions. Yes, I'll take an intervention. Ruth Maguire. 
Alison Harris for taking the intervention. I wonder if she would acknowledge that when children experience trauma in younger years, that that can have an impact on their development. So, so not all 12 year olds are the same. Alison Harris. Well, I think it's certainly fair to say that I don't think two individuals are actually the same, but we have to actually come to an agreement of a certain age where we have to actually agree that something has to come in. And for me, I think, you know, 12 is that age. In an ideal world, no child would commit a crime. But unfortunately, there are various factors that cause this to be impossible. And I believe there has to be a cutoff where responsibility is introduced. I think 12 is the fairest age to deliver this cutoff because I believe the majority of teenagers should by that point know what is right and what is wrong. Some people are advocating raising the age of criminal responsibility further to 14 or 16, but I think such a move could have unintended consequences. Throughout the UK, we have seen some disturbing stories. When you look at the number of stabbings taking place in London, the rise in gang culture and instances where youths have been throwing fireworks at people in the streets and the rate in Scotland at which teenagers are taking knives into school, it seems apparent that more work needs to be done beyond any further ideas of raising the age of responsibility. And the nature of crime is changing too. We have organised crime groups targeting children and teenagers and enticing them into crime. And we don't want to give these groups more of an opportunity to do this just because they know that children in this age group have immunity from prosecution. I think people are a little more sympathetic when the perpetrator in question is a young child. If we start to include teenagers here, I think that sympathy will wane very quickly. On an emotional level, imagine telling the family of a victim of a serious crime that the perpetrator cannot be identified and has not received legal punishment for their actions because they are 14 going on 15 years of age. I think it's balance that is therefore needed. So at stage one, I wanted to take a little time to outline how I feel on this subject. I know that during this stage, there are a lot of ideas being proposed before stage two, and I think we should all fully consider the possible side effects of our actions when legislating on such an important matter. There are other matters that I haven't had time to explore today. These include the associated powers of the police if the age of responsibility is raised, as well as the considerations that will need to be made for victims and ensuring fairness is observed all round. I'm confident that both these topics will be explored fully throughout each stage of this bill, and I look forward to following its progress. Deputy Presiding Officer, I will be supporting the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill today because, as I laid out earlier, the act of raising the age of responsibility to 12 appears to be sensible, practical and fair. I hope these factors continue to prevail in the Bill's progression in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, probably a hostage to fortune. Before I call Stuart Stevenson, can I say there is time in hand to be more expansive in your contribution. Oh dear, I may regret that. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Mr Stevenson, please. Um, my arithmetic says I've got about 17 minutes, uh, presiding officer, but I'm sure you'll haul me up at the appropriate, uh, uh, appropriate point. Uh, presiding officer, um, I, I think it's uh, as well to think about how children develop. Now, I'm not a dad, so I haven't personally been through this, but psychologists uh, give us a sort of guideline. But before talking about what they say, I uh, spoke to a GERFEC conference uh, on behalf of the Minister Adam Ingram, because I was able to do it as a minister, he wasn't uh, at the right location. And immediately before I spoke, there was a wonderful film of a one hour old ch child. Music was being played to the child and the child was waving its arms in time to the beat. And when the music stopped, they stopped waving their arms. And when it started again, they waved their arms. In other words, children start to interact with their environment uh, from the very point of birth, uh, and perhaps even before that. Uh, psychologists would say that in the first year, we recognize human faces. Year three, we start to acknowledge the past to interpret present events. At year seven, we start to tell jokes, and some people have not moved on from that stage. And at 11, we start to be more uh, conscious of our moral codes. But our personal development is quite varied, and it's unique uh, to us. And of course, children in particular who are raised in less than ideal conditions as a result of poverty, 
missing parent uh, or other circumstances may well have developed at a much uh, slower rate. The one thing I think uh, that we've heard from many parts of the chamber today, which I would agree, is whatever the maturity uh, of a child, prison is no place for a child. And that's why our uh, children's hearing system is an absolute beacon uh, to the world as to how uh, we should treat those in difficulties. And I, uh, as an MSP, had the great privilege of being able to sit in on a children's hearing. I cannot, of course, tell you anything about uh, the detail of what went on there. But the key point about it was it was child-centered. And I think that is absolutely correct. And you would need to work very hard to persuade me uh, otherwise. Now, of course, uh, We've talked about numbers in this debate quite considerably. Um, I will say, as a mathematician, uh, you might think that one and one equals two. I can tell you there are five alternative answers to the one plus one uh, philosophy. I if time permits, at the very end, I'll come back and explain what they are. Uh, so just as in mathematics, uh, so in this debate. Now, Margaret Mitchell very usefully gave us quite a long and interesting list of rights that you acquire at the age of 12. Now, I certainly heard things I hadn't uh, been aware of uh, before. Um, it, it's, worth, uh, it's, it's worth saying that you can get a firearms certificate at the age of 14. Um, you can get a shotgun certificate at any age. There is no age qualification, but you require to be supervised when you're exercising your rights uh, with a shotgun certificate up to the age of 15. So there are a whole series of uh, different ages. You can start to uh, fly an aircraft at the age of 14. Uh, you can drive uh, on the public highway in a car at the age of 17. There is no, yeah, I will. I'm very grateful, sorry. Sorry, wait for Alec, Cole, Alex Cole Hamilton, please. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to the member for giving way. The member is describing a range of ages of majority around uh, physical limitations or physical capacities. But does he recognise that this chamber only very recently extended the franchise to 16-year-olds, which credits 16-year-olds with sufficient judgment to decide on the right government for them? Should we not be pushing the age of criminal responsibility further? Because if we can recognise that people only have the capacity at 16 to judge politically, then what about their actions of right? right and wrong um, in the ages preceding that. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, the member makes a good point, which I'm, I'm going to just simply pass on. I will, I will say, of course, the bill itself makes interesting comments at section 39 and section 43, uh, where it talks about take account of the child's age and maturity. And I think that makes a very important point. Uh, I stopped growing when I was 12 years old because I uh, was given a hormone treatment for a particular condition I have and I just stopped growing. It didn't help the uh, condition, I may say. Uh, but uh, children mature physically and mentally at varying rates. And I think whatever we do, uh, we have to take account of that. And I'm pleased to see uh, that in, uh, in the bill uh, that uh, there is at different points of the bill uh, account uh, taken of that. I'm also very pleased uh, to something rather obvious that this is not a justice bill, which it could have been if you think about it. And there are references to justice uh, committee activities. It is an equalities and human rights bill. And I think uh, that is entirely uh, 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 appropriate. Um, but on age, we're adults at 18, probably for most purposes, but not all, some it's 21. Um, there's no uh, age restriction on opening a bank account. You can open it as soon as you can sign anything, um, although you can't have bank credit uh, until you're 18. Uh, there is a wee issue in the bill and that it, the assumption is that there's certainty about when people are 12. Uh, Bashir Ahmed, MSP, a late member uh, and friend in this chamber, actually didn't know what his birthday was. And many people who come to Scotland from other jurisdictions are in that circumstance. He was given a birthday, but there was no certainty about it, uh, by the legal system. So if you go and look up the records, you will see something there. But he, apparently his mother, when asked, said, when was he born? She said spring, and that was all there was to know. So I think uh, in some parts of uh, uh, the, 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 the bill here, uh, possibly at uh, section uh, 23, 
for example, uh, we might say a constable reasonably believes somebody to be under 12 because there can't always uh, be uh, certainty. And that applies uh, at a, n a number of places throughout, uh, uh, throughout the, the, uh, the bill that we have uh, before us. Um, Turning to the detail of the bill, presiding officer, and I'm alert to your guidance that I should head towards a conclusion, um, that uh, there are a couple of wee things, my usual one, at section 28.7, the definition of vehicle says it includes a vessel, which well, should include an aircraft as well, although it might be ultra uh, to do that, and I'm not absolutely uh, certain about that. We heard about uh, children's right to refuse to answer questions. Um, I do see that's covered at 46.2 uh, and equally at section 42, so I'm not quite clear what more uh, we might have to do. Concluding with uh, the uh, report from the committee upon which I congratulate them, uh, I think we come back to what is a place of safety. And I think it might be helpful if we were able to uh, document or see a document in coming to a conclusion on that of where there are places of safety across Scotland. So we can assess if there are enough of them. Presiding officer, I'm obliged for your indulgence. Not at all. We're very grateful to Mr. Stevenson. Uh, I now call Angus MacDonald, who's the last speaker in the open debate. Mr. MacDonald, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to be taking part in this debate today, not just given the fact that we as a parliament continually strive to uh, take forward legislation that will benefit our citizens, but that we look to create a society which is progressive in nature with welfare and equality at its heart. Um, having looked over the salient points of the evidence taken by the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, it's, it's clear to see there is widespread support for the aims of the bill, uh, and that's to be welcomed. And it's also clear that there's a, a feeling that this bill is long overdue, and that it is required to bring Scotland as a forward-looking nation into line with our international partners. Uh, the bill itself speaks to what we've long strived for, uh, to be progressive in our policies to uphold and protect our commitment to international human rights standards. Uh, the fact that in Scotland, a child aged eight is criminally responsible for their actions, which has been the case for the past 86 years, given that in 1932, it was raised from the, the age of seven. And I think Gail Ross mentioned uh, that it was 1937, but the information I have is that it was 1932, but I could be wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. So um, it's also the case, as we've heard on a number of occasions this afternoon, that this is the youngest age of criminal responsibility in Europe uh, and has been a source of criticism for some time. And if we put this into context, our nearest neighbours in the UK have criminal responsibility aged at 10 years, whilst the average across the 28 member states of the EU is uh, almost 14. Uh, when we further compare this with other nations across the globe, uh, Russia, Russia's age of criminal responsibility is 14, which is the same in North and South Korea. China has an age of responsibility of 16, although in cases of serious issues such as intentional homicide and intentional hurt to cause serious injury or death, people are considered criminally responsible from the age of 14. And we've heard comparison, uh, comparisons in the debate this afternoon about the differences in these ages between countries. However, as the minister uh, stated in her opening speech, these comparisons do not take into account the differences in which Scotland deals with these issues. If while some countries employ tailored penal sentences for the age and maturity of a child between the ages of 14 and 17, or there are no examples of a juvenile justice system, Scotland has its children's hearing system dedicated to providing welfareist solutions for children when these issues arise. Presiding officer, there's a clear, a clear requirement to raise the age of criminal responsibility from its current age of eight. Uh, not only is it recognised that the heavy-handed nature of the criminal justice system is counterproductive for children and young people, but there's also significant evidence to suggest that it leads to further issues in a child's future. The evidence of harm caused by treating children as offenders from such a young age is clear with studies showing young people and children who have been involved with police and the justice system at a young age were more likely to offend as adults. In raising the age of criminal responsibility, we're further contributing to a youth justice system that is appropriate and considers the benefit to both the children and young people subject to the system, but aims to provide a benefit to the country as a whole. We must take cognizance, however, of the evidence presented from organizations and individuals with experience of the youth and criminal justice systems. 
The general principles of this bill will contribute to our commitments to international human rights standards. Um, there are those, however, who would, and as we've heard, like to see the Scottish Government take steps in increasing the age of criminal responsibility further to the age of uh, 14 and possibly beyond, uh, and in line with the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, the majority of members across the Chamber will have encountered school groups in the time they have been elected. Uh, some may well have visited several schools within their regions or constituencies, so we'll all therefore be aware of the work being undertaken by classes the length and breadth of the country to understand the UNCRC uh, from a young age. So, as long as we as a parliament and along with government are committed to furthering the aims of the UNCRC and can continue to take progressive steps in this area, particularly where our children and young people are given the opportunities they need to realise their aspirations, then we will, as a nation, be all the better for it. President Officer, we have already heard this afternoon about the provision of a place of safety, such as a police station, being undesirable. However, it's clear that this is in very specific circumstances, and I'm glad to hear the Minister's opening statement that the Scottish Government will further clarify this situation through a prepared amendment. It remains, however, that several key factors have to be taken into account in what can be incredibly constrained and pressurised uh, situations. In the majority of cases, a place of safety will be familiar to the child or the young person uh, and will have their own safety and any risk of further harm taken into account. We must recognise that these situations can be incredibly traumatic for them and that further trauma, trauma can detrimentally affect their future, which we already know can lead to further issues. Increasing the age of criminal responsibility fits within Scotland's wider context of being a trauma-informed nation and recognises that dealing with the root causes of harmful behaviour supports the child to move on from harmful behaviour but also lessens the, the odds of that behaviour being repeated, which is beneficial for the country as a whole. In closing, presiding officer, it's fair to say that this is a long-awaited positive step in the right direction for children and young people and for Scotland as a nation. However, it's incumbent upon us all to continue to strive for and do more to ensure that we are keeping in line with our ambition to be a globally progressive nation that is the best country in the world for a child to grow up in. We must take into account the wider evidence of increasing the age of criminal responsibility further when it is right, necessary and appropriate to do so. And I would encourage the Scottish Government to see what other steps are available to them uh, now and in the future in order to strengthen this legislation through the further stages to realise these aims. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Macdonald. I turn to closing speeches. Colin Daniel Johnson, close for Labour. Mr Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I mean, I'd like to begin my remarks by thanking all members who have contributed to the, the debate. I think it has been one that's been thought-provoking, it's been constructive, and that's not to say that there hasn't been disagreement, but I think it was set in context very well, both by the Minister and, indeed, by Oliver Mundell's opening contributions. And I think what was important uh, was uh, the minister in her opening remarks acknowledging that this is a move that is perhaps overdue, but it's also one which is being made uh, in, a, in, a, in a reflective manner and one where she's committed to listening. And I think that's absolutely right. This isn't an easy thing to get right. And I think it is important that we all listen. But likewise, I'd like to thank Oliver Mundell for his contributions, because while his uh, side of the House is undoubtedly coming uh, to this issue with a degree of caution, I think his acknowledgement of the vulnerabilities of children and the fact that children who find themselves in the criminal justice system aren't always, or don't always receive the support that they need, um, I think is absolutely right. And I think there's been some discussion as to, to where this debate properly sits, whether this is a criminal justice issue or an issue around children. And I think absolutely, let's be clear, it is both, because it is where those two issues come into uh, contact. And I think whenever you consider the, the issues around um, the criminal justice system, um, uh, incarceration, punishment, uh, the courts, how we arrive at those decisions, we need to seek balance. I think any result from the criminal justice system balances a number of things. Restitution, I think it's important the individual, I think, makes up for the, the, what they have done. That there is reform and rehabilitation. 
You can't take any of these elements apart. And I think those, all of those elements become absolutely critically sensitive in the area of, of children and when they have come into contact with the law. That with those ideas about uh, improving behavior, rehabilitating, I think uh, become so much more delicate uh, when it comes to children. So I think in, in the context of this debate, perhaps um, you know, those are the, the, the issues we've been dealing with. But I'd also like to thank Alex Cole Hamilton because I think he provided the, the, the challenge that this debate absolutely requires. You know, this is a serious decision, one that is definitely overdue, and it is one that requires challenge, especially to those of us who are perhaps taking a more cautious line than he and others uh, might, might like. But then let me address some of those things. First of all, on time, I think some um, comment has been made about there being 80 years um, since the age of criminal responsibility was set at eight. I would gently point out we now have the Scottish Parliament, and I think those of us who are frustrated about that length of time must take that duty uh, seriously to keep the law under review, to both reflect when this law passes uh, as to how it has operated and what its impact has been, and to review it. We cannot allow another 20 years of this Parliament coming into being before we look at these ideas and challenge them. But secondly, I, I would, in some ways, um, I, I think the issue here is, is the fact that we're setting an age at all. I think the most important thing is that we do not uh, treat whatever age we arrive at as a cliff edge. And I think in, in that regard, perhaps Stuart Stevenson's contribution was perhaps the most instructive. It's absolutely right to point out some people don't know their birthday. And I think that evidence is just how arbitrary that is. I think that there are a number of, of speakers have pointed out that the, the, the ability of an individual to understand in a mature fashion both their, their actions, their consequences, and, and how they can reform is absolutely vital. That does not happen at a single age. The thought that somehow there is a magic age at which one accrues all rights, all responsibilities, all understandings, I think is mistaken. What we need is a system that is reflective and that treats every individual appropriate, especially when they are under the age of 18. So I think that is what we must strive for, and I think that is what we, we, we must ensure happens in the system, I think both in terms of the explicit context of this bill and beyond. A number of speakers uh, pointed to, as I did, uh, about the importance of the children's panel, and I think uh, you know, Gail Ross uh, set out uh, the context of uh, how it came into being, and just and a number of other speakers, how important they are. I, I would gently point out, we must protect that. The evidence that was taken by the Education Committee last year did point to a picture of a, an increasing adversarial nature, the increasing use of legal representation within that, that context, and indeed children themselves often feeling alienated by that. I think we must take a very close watch on this, and in some ways I, I, I am, I'm concerned that the bill didn't uh, speak more about uh, improvements that could be made to the children's uh, hearing system. A number of, of speakers also uh, referred to the importance of understanding the vulnerabilities of children. I think Rona Mackay did an, an excellent uh, job of outlining that, as did my colleague uh, Mary Fee. I think that's absolutely vital, and there's a number of statistics one can use, and I would like to wheel out one that I like to, to reflect on. And it's one very personal to me, as, as, and I've spoken about ADHD on a number of occasions in this chamber. General incidence of ADHD in the population is 5%. In Poland, a recent study has found that 40% of young people in Poland have ADHD. And that's not the only indicator like that. Acquired uh, uh, head trauma, um, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, and a number of other things are disproportionately overrepresented in the young offenders population. And I think we need to understand both why people come into contact with the criminal justice and the underlying issues and deal with those appropriately. And I think Rona Mackay was absolutely right on that. And fundamentally, I think Mary Fee is absolutely right to uh, point out that we need to understand the neuroscience. We are at the absolute beginning of a huge uh, increase in the, our understanding of how the brain works and why people behave they do. And we must take cognizance of that in the education system and the criminal justice system. I think that's hugely uh, important. Um, I would just like to, 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 to go back to the police powers because I think a number of people um, highlighted the, the need to look at what the experience under this new regime would actually look like. And I think when you look at the police powers in the round in this bill, I think we do need to scrutinize this carefully at stage two, whether one is looking at the place of safety, the powers of the police uh, with regard to search and interview, 
I think ch clan child law were absolutely right to say in their evidence that children whose behaviour is not deemed criminal must not face criminal consequences. And I think we must challenge those provisions to make sure that this bill isn't doing exactly that. Uh, in, in short, I think that the, the terminology that's being used is that children below the age of criminal responsibility would be deemed to have harmful behaviour. I think what is absolutely vital is that what we don't do is just simply change the, 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 the terminology from criminal behaviour to, to harmful behaviour. There must be a complete change in terms of the approach and, and how um, uh, services and, in, and especially the police uh, respond. Absolutely, as Gordon Lindhurst uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I, I know which, close? well, it may be that decision time's advanced, I don't know about that yet, but therefore I'm, I'm taking speeches to the limit now, so if you could conclude, I will, please. I, I will close. We, police must That's investigate, but it That's cannot be to time. the cost of the child. Ultimately, Labour are uh, pleased to be supporting this bill at stage one. We agree with what it, uh, uh, the, the steps that it take. They, they are overdue, um, and we will uh, look forward to, to scrutinising the issues that I've raised through stages two and three. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I call uh, Liam Kerr, and I can give you up to eight minutes again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Closing for Conservatives. I'm pleased to close for the Scottish Conservatives and speak in favour of the principles of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. The fundamental principle of this bill is around the age of criminal responsibility, but I think Daniel Johnson made a really good point right at the end there because it actually opens up much wider questions about the nature and definition of crime, who is and who should be deemed a criminal, and relations of power and vulnerability, which will no doubt stimulate very interesting debate as the bill progresses. Now, the key principle which the bill seeks to address is the minimum age at which a child can be held criminally, criminally responsible, being eight. Now, it was pointed out by several contributors to the report and by Fulton McGregor that this age, which, as Ruth McGuire said, was set in 1932, is the lowest in Europe. That is certainly challenging. It's not a good look. And as Rona Mackay said, it is completely out of sync with how we treat children in Scotland. I thought Gail Ross spoke very powerfully and persuasively that at such a low age we would be responding to welfare issues and she told of the consequences of the current position on those aged 8 to 11. She said clearly we are all agreed that the minimum age should be raised and she's right. So if not 8 then what should that age be? Well the bill's second principle is that it should be 12. The debate this afternoon I think has made clear that this makes sense. One of the reasons we have a current age of criminal responsibility at eight is because those below this age are deemed to lack the mental capacity to commit a crime. And that mental capacity point, I think, is the appropriate and correct standard against which to consider this. To ask ourselves, at what age do we think children have the maturity to be responsible in law for their actions? Do we think that even where they know the difference between right and wrong, children can understand the difference between various levels of wrongdoing? and should be held criminally responsible for those actions. Now, persuasive guidance that that age is 12 is provided by the policy memorandum and Gordon Lindhurst and Margaret Mitchell, who cited the Law Society, saying children aged 12 and over can make a will. They can consent to or veto adoption. They have sufficient capacity to express views on future arrangements for care in private law proceedings. They can form a view to express at a children's hearing and instruct a solicitor. And, of course, it's the basic age of change to secondary school. Would the member take an of course I would. Alec right, Cole Hamilton. I'm grateful for the member for taking the intervention. If the member is persuaded that 12 is the age at which, which children reach mental capacity in this country, does he and his party therefore ex support the extension of the voting age to 12 year olds? The extension of the voting age to 12 year olds in a general election, for example, I would take an awful lot of persuasion to... When, when do they have that chance? Can I come back to the point? Because I do want to address Alex Cole Hamilton directly uh, when we come to raising the age beyond 12. Uh, something that no one's mentioned today was that uh, Lord Dolakia uh, tried to introduce a similar move to this in England. And he argued that children of 10 and 11 have less ability to think through the consequences of their actions, less ability to empathize with other people's feelings, and less ability to control impulsive behavior. And therefore, it cannot be right to deal with such young children in a criminal process based on 
ideas of culpability which assume a capacity for adult-like decision-making. I also find it persuasive that, as Margaret Mitchell flagged, the number of incidents involving under-12s currently reported as offending is small and reducing, and the Minister reported that most of this behaviour is minor to moderate. I was pleased to hear Gordon Lindhurst cite Police Scotland's evidence that the nature of children's actions and the prevalence of that behaviour changes as the age group increases to 12. And finally, I think it's important that the committee uh, concluded, and Oliver Mundell raised this, uh, that uh, 12 appears to be a publicly acceptable age and has both professional and public confidence. Now, some members, most particularly Alex Cole Hamilton and Drona Mackay, feel the age should be higher. We'd find any such move difficult to support, not because Richard Lyle believes that Alex Cole Hamilton is grandstanding. He's not. I believe he's totally sincere, and I think he's an important voice in this, although I don't agree with him on this particular point. But I do think that Richard Lyle's point about living in the real world uh, holds water. I find Alison Harris's thoughts persuasive when she said it's not helpful to say that country X has it at uh, an age of 14 or 16, so why not us? When each... Will I get time at the end? So no. Yes, of course. Alec Colhamel. I've heard twice now members challenging my position on increasing it beyond 12 as not living in the real world. Can I point to the rest of the real world, which largely have ages of criminal responsibility higher than 12? Liam Kerr. And, but on that point, the real world, I was simply picking up that it was the words that uh, Richard Lyle said, but Marie Todd, the minister, made this point in the committee, and she made the point in response to your intervention, or in response to Alex Cole Hamilton's intervention earlier. She said in committee, it's clear you cannot make direct comparisons between countries because the headline age does not capture the nuance. And cited, for example, Luxembourg, which nominally has a criminal age of responsibility of 18, yet does permit its youth court to impose penal measures. Uh, we have to think, before we would make such a monumental change going above uh, 12, we'd have to be very careful to examine any unintended consequences, such as, as Alison Harris warned, organised crime outfits targeting teenagers for recruitment based on a newfound lack of capacity to commit a crime. Or perhaps, very much thinking aloud, where teenagers commit sexual violence crimes against other teenagers or children. Is a challenging enough system for victims already without being told the person lacked the capacity to commit a crime. Now, I found the discussion on police powers and particularly the place of safety interesting. Again, I thought Alex Cole Hamilton spoke powerfully on this, uh, on the place of safety and definitions behind that. Police Scotland recognised the concerns around place of safety but pointed to a lack of locations and said that there have to be resources and suitable premises to which a child can be taken and in which they feel safe. Like Fulton McGregor and Angus MacDonald, I was pleased to hear the Minister undertake to consider carefully the committee's request that the Scottish Government provide further information on the suitability of police stations and for data to be gathered. Presiding Officer, this chamber is called today to indicate its support or otherwise for the principles of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill. The Equalities Committee's report and today's debate provide compelling evidence that the current age of eight for criminal responsibility is no longer sustainable. Similarly, I think we've heard good evidence that 12 is an appropriate age at which to set criminal responsibility, including agency, legal precedent, and public acceptance. Accordingly, the Scottish Conservatives will support the principles of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill at decision time tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Kerr. And I call on Marie Todd to close the government. Minister, 10 minutes, please, or thereabouts. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you uh, very much to members around the Chamber for their contributions today. This debate has been constructive and open, and I want to make absolutely clear my commitment to keep working together on this complex and crucial matter. I'm really encouraged to see the messages of support for raising the age of criminal responsibility. For too long, the age of criminal responsibility in Scotland was labelled as too difficult. The scale of the challenge has been responsibly faced up to by this bill. We know that harmful behaviour involving primary school aged children is rare and seriously harmful behaviour is even rarer. The overall number of children referred to the children's reporter for offending has declined significantly and that's due to the impact of the whole system approach which incorporates early and in effective intervention policies and processes and which is part of getting it right for every child, hears the voice of that child in moving forward from crisis. That work will continue. 
A response to harm needs to have the confidence of those harmed and those responding to harm. And we need to build understanding of how this will work with children and with those working with and for children. That work is beyond legislation. It's about guidance, training, experience and culture. I want to assure you all that I have listened very carefully to today's debate and I'll respond fully to the issues raised today in the, report, in the response I'm going to um, send to the, and the issues raised in the report by the committee in the response that I send to the committee. I'm going to fo focus on some of the broad themes that have been raised in today's debate though. First of all, the theme of the age of 12. What we're proposing to do is to move children of primary school age completely out of the criminal justice system and that is a significant reform for Scotland. We know that a disproportionate number of children involved in offending have faced severe disadvantage and adversity in their early childhood and the bill recognises this and by removing the criminal label from these children we're choosing to no longer differentiate between those in harmful behaviour and those who are subject to harm. And I acknowledge that it's taken us a very long time to get to this point, but I simply suggest that that fact alone reflects the challenge and complexity involved. Readiness to move beyond 12 is not simply about public opinion. It's about making sure that our professionals understand how to respond to harmful behaviour without a criminalising label or response that systems are ready to respond when things go wrong without relying on that lens of criminality and that the integrity of investigations is protected, that victims understand that such a response is the best chance to reduce the likelihood of further harm and that sufficient interventions are available for as long as they need to be and that children and families know that there is legal certainty and protection of their rights throughout. Raising the age of criminal responsibility has to be looked at in the wider context of reform in Scotland. For example, the complexity around 16 to 18 year olds who are still children in UNCRC terms and need to be responded to accordingly is absolutely recognised. Specific work to better support them is being advanced under the Child Protection Improvement Programme. These young people who are there in trouble are being supported by good practice around multi-agency early and effective intervention and diversion from prosecution in order to keep young people out of formal systems as far as possible in line with our successful whole system approach to youth justice. Now, while I'm confident that the provisions in the bill offer Scotland the right reform at this time, I am keen to listen and work with colleagues across the chamber to consider future reform. And if it was decided that increasing the age beyond 12 should be the direction of travel, it's absolutely clear that there are challenging questions around this which we need to address and answer. In terms of the specific um, allegation of not, why are we not being more bold, I would argue that we are. Age of criminal responsibility is just one part of the picture. We have many members in the debate today who mentioned the unique children's hearing system, which already gives us a flexible, graded, child-centred approach, which looks at the child's needs and not their deeds. We have the policy of getting it right for every child or GERFEC. We have the whole system approach. We have early and effective intervention. We have right across government and right across our NHS and education systems, better recognition and understanding of ACES. We're developing training and trauma-informed responses across the whole workforce so that services and professionals can apply that knowledge when they work with children and families every day. We have also made a commitment to UNCRC incorporation and a commitment to a PVG review and a management of a member's offenders bill. Yes, I will. As Carl Hamilton, I'm very, I'm very grateful uh, to the Minister for giving way. Um, I have made a lot of trouble of myself in this debate intervening on my view that we should go further than 12. But one thing the Minister and I are completely united on is the need to incorporate the UNCRC into Scots law. Can she give us a guarantee that that will happen within this parliamentary session? Minister. As the member knows from the response, written response to the committee today, I can give you a guarantee that we are committed to doing it. The legislative reform is a necessary but it, a part of the, our, this pro, approach to children in Scotland, but it's not sufficient alone. The real change comes from a multifaceted approach which leads to culture change. 
Now, in response to some of the issues raised in particular during the debate, the place of safety, I have to be absolutely clear. This is an emergency power which is restricted to a clearly articulated lawful purpose to protect people from immediate risk of significant harm or further such harm. It is not, I repeat, it is not a power of detention. The place of safety could be the child's home, it could be a friend's home, it could be a granny's home, it could be a local authority residential facility, a hospital or a surgery. Essentially, it could be any place where the person who occupies it is willing to receive temporarily that child. Now, I have to emphasise again, a police station should only ever be used as a last resort and for the shortest necessary period of time before somewhere else can be found. And this is made very clear in the wording of Section 23 of the Bill. I've mentioned already that I'm willing to take forward an amendment to ensure that there's a presumption against the use of police cells as a place of safety. And I'm also willing to look at um, monitoring the use of them. Oliver Mundell. I thank uh, the Minister for taking an intervention. I would just ask that she is cautious as that amendment is drawn up because I think of my own rural constituency uh, where I imagine at three o'clock in the morning, for example, it might not be possible to find somewhere nearby and the idea of taking people to somewhere that they know within their own community could still be preferable to driving them for a matter of hours uh, to another facility. So I would just ask uh, that she does listen uh, to, to what children and young people have to say on that. Minister. <laughs> Absolutely, and as a member who represents a rural um, area myself, I agree um, completely. However, I do think there, is a, there can be a distinction drawn between using a police station and using police cells. In response to Gordon Lindhurst's um, point about victim information, it is right to share limited information, but we need to be very mindful of the importance of a child's personal and family circumstances being held confidential. It does matter that that perpetrator is a child, especially a young child. If we want to work with child perpetrators to succeed in building their empathy, their responsibility and their resilience, then it has to take place in confidence. In response to Daniel Johnson's point about the children's hearing system becoming more adversarial and not wanting it to become a court of law, I absolutely acknowledge last year's Education and Skills Committee inquiry into the children's hearing reforms. Action is being taken by the multi-agency children hearing improvement partnership to implement the 32 better hearing standards and will write to the committee with an update. Um, I agree absolutely on the fundamental importance of hearings remaining conversations, not confrontations. And with regard to Stuart Stevenson, um, in terms of determining the age of 12, is, is a child actually under 12? There is um, an established process for assessing a child's age, if it's not certain. Um, it is set out in detail in the 2012 Age Assessment Practice Guidance, and Section 124 of the Children's Hearing Act 2011 recognises the requirement to establish a child's age before a hearing. Um, in conclusion... This bill aims to address the complexity and to take a serious-minded look at our context and to address the needs of all of Scotland's children, removing primary school ch age children from criminalisation and addressing the needs of those affected in harmful behaviour, whether as victims, as perpetrators or both. Detailed work with care and justice organisations, stakeholders and with children and young people has been ongoing throughout the development of the bill and we'll continue that as we move forward. I again offer to meet with members from across the chamber to discuss the detail of the bill and to take the time required to work through the complexities that the bill addresses. In this year of young people, I am very grateful for the careful consideration of so many and look forward to our next steps together. Thank you very much. And that concludes our stage one debate on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. Uh, the next item of business is consideration of motion 14567 on a financial resolution for the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. Could I call on Derek Mackay to move the motion? Formally moved. Thank you very much. And now I'm minded to accept a motion without notice to bring forward decision time till now. Could I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business and Veteran Affairs to do so? Uh, moved, President. Thank you very much. 
So I'll put the question. The question is that decision time is moved forward to now. Does everybody agree? Yes. Thank you. We are agreed. So we come to decision time. The first question is that motion 14704 in the name of Marie Todd on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill at Stage 1 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the second question is that motion 14567 in the name of Derek Mackay on a financial resolution uh, to the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move to members' business in the name of Stuart McMillan on Texas Instruments, and we'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister to change seats.